Hi everyone, my name is AJ Keith. In this lecture, I'm gonna be covering various molecular techniques that are commonly used in neurobiology. And I'm gonna to try to explain both when the technique is typically utilized and how the technique actually works. So hopefully for each methodology, you will know when and why it's done and also the general process involved. Going into this video, I expect my audience has a, a basic understanding of biology. And so I won't be explaining things like what kilodaltons are or a polymerase or an antibody. I, I'd like to just jump right into the details. And so this presentation is kind of designed for graduate level students. Um, if anyone in this present, if, if anything in this presentation is, is incorrect or you would like me to clarify, please comment and let me know. Uh, also subscribe if you enjoy the video and, and I, I do hope you enjoy it and I hope you watch all of it and hope you learn a ton. So we're going to begin our discussion of methodology with something very basic and fundamental to molecular biology. And that's simply extracting DNA or on RNA from cells. So the success of any technique that manipulates or analyzes nucleic acid is going to depend heavily on how well the original tissue is processed. Typically tissue to be analyzed is immediately flash frozen or sometimes submerged in a solution of something like RNA later, which preserves RNA and protects it from RNases. The extraction of RNA in particular is sensitive to tissue processing procedures because RNA is inherently unstable because of its molecular structure. It not only is single stranded, but it contains that additional oxygen group that if deprotonated in high pH conditions can attack its own phosphate backbone and then autocleave itself. Not only that, but RNA is also rapidly degraded by RNase enzymes in the tissue itself. So when extracting RNA, all of these things need to be considered. There are a few very simple tips that can greatly increase your yield of RNA. And they include firstly, making sure that you are using copious amounts of RNA zap wherever you go and everything you touch. RNA zap is a solution of RNase inhibitor. And you might be surprised to learn that RNases are basically everywhere. They're flying out of your, your mouth and your breath. They are everywhere on your skin. They're floating around in the air. So spraying everything down with RNA zap can inhibit a lot of these contaminating enzymes. Another important consideration when extracting RNA is that every second it takes you to freeze your tissue after extracting it from the animal is, is RNA lost. So if you're gonna analyze RNA of brain tissue, for example, you would need to be quick at taking off that skull in a consistent manner because every second in variation can change the yield between samples. So tissue is often stored in these special solutions to, uh, designed to preserve RNA, such as RNA later. In fact, sometimes when an animal's when an animal is 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 actually directly perfused with RNA later, uh, prior to the extraction, and this helps stop that initial degradation of RNA, and and it gives you more time to get it out um, out of the brain and then uh, flash frozen. In order to actually extract your RNA or DNA, you want to first homogenize your tissue. And this is typically done in something like a mortar and pestle. And you, you physically grind up the tissue and you lyse the cells into kind of a fine powder. And nucleic extraction, nucleic acid extraction is done almost exclusively with uh, commercially purchased kits. Now to be totally honest, the, the specifics of how they work is not all that important. The important part is that you follow the steps, follow the step-by-step -step instructions on the kits, and about 30 minutes, you will have extracted nucleic acid. They simply involve a couple of steps of washing, uh, centrifugation, supernatant collection, and really, they're pretty straightforward. Now, once you have your purified nucleic acid from the commercially available kit, you will want to assess its, its quality and its quantity. And this is done with a, a spectro a spectro monitor spectrophotometer, sorry, that measures the absorbance at 260, wave, at the, uh, 260 nanometer wavelength. In contamination, absorbance at 280 or 
two thirty uh, will be indicated by these kind of these peaks over here, and so you can assess the purity of your sample based on the uh, wavelengths of light that are being absorbed. Uh, nucleic acid quality can also be um, uh, checked through gel electrophoresis, which we're going to discuss in a moment, but in the context of separating proteins. But just remember that it can also be used to separate uh, DNA and RNA. So once we have our extracted DNA or RNA, you may want to amplify that material. And that is done by PCR or polymerase chain reaction. So this is definitely the most fundamental technique in molecular biology. And it's basically um, in vitro or cell-free cloning because you're, you're replicating DNA or, or RNA. So the ability to replicate DNA without a, with, without a cell is, is a very, very useful technique. So, so how is it done? First, RNA is extracted and it's typically done with that commercially purchased kit um, I won't go into detail, but extracting DNA has been streamlined by the, these kits to the point where, you, as a researcher, you simply follow a couple of bullet points, and before you know it, you will have purified DNA from your sample. Um, anyways, first, we, we obviously need to have the DNA that we intend on cloning. Then we need, uh, we need our primers, and this is where the specificity of the reaction is actually determined by these, these primers right here. So, so primers are just these short 20 base pair chemically synthesized oligonucleotides that are typically ordered from a commercial uh, company. They are designed to be complementary to the five, five prime and three prime flanking sequences of the genetic location of interest you want to amplify. And this is this is going to be called the amplicon. It's usually a 100 to two or 100 to 300 base pair genetic sequence. So if you wanted to amplify this gene right here, whatever, whatever is right here, uh, you would make a primer complementary to the five prime sequence and the three prime sequence on the other strand. And it could be a gene you're interested in, for example, or something that you want to see if is present in the in the tissue. And a lot of work actually goes into perfecting these primers. So there are many different uh, web resources to help researchers generate the the right primers for their experiment. Okay, so so what's what's actually the point of making these primers? Well, they they prime a polymerase. Because remember, DNA polymerase requires a five, a five prime OH in order to begin polymerizing. And so these primers not only direct the polymerase to a very specific region of the genome, but they are also needed for its enzymatic activity. However, in, in order for a primer to bind DNA in direct polymerase, the polymerase reaction, the DNA strands, they, they need to obviously be separated. And so to separate the DNA to allow primer binding, the temperature is increased and this melts the DNA strands. And then as the temperature uh, decreases, the primers bind and they prime the reaction. So this initially actually posed a big problem for researchers because this heat treatment would denature any polymerase enzymes and so it wasn't until the discovery of this heat resistant polymerase called TAC found in these hot springs, archaea, that this reaction could be fully automated because these enzymes would survive the, the melting of, of the DNA strands. And so just to summarize, this reaction requires a couple main things. First, as a researcher, you need to be able to properly design primers towards uh, whatever genomic segment you are interested in. And you also need to own some TAC polymerases. Uh, nucleotides, obviously you need nucleotides to uh, extend the amplicon. And you also need some reaction buffer and and, and all of these things are, are ordered online. The most difficult part is, is primer design. Again, there are many online resources to help design the best primer for your target gene. Um, the process is also commonly automated now. And so a thermocycler is typically used because it automatically 
melts the DNA, and then it cools the test tube. So the primers can bind and it allows polymerization, then automatically reheats and melts the new synthesized DNA for another round of amplification. And so this exponentially uh, increases the, the amount of DNA in your, in your um, thermocycler. So although PCR is relatively straightforward, it, it can be very in, inexplicably difficult at times. So some sources of error include um, mispriming, where, where, where primers uh, bind more or less randomly or at somewhat complementary sequences, and they prime polymerization at non-target genes. And this can occur if the reaction isn't isn't quickly transferred to a thermocycler because even at room temperature, the, the PCR reaction can still occur and non-specific amplification uh, before entering the thermocycler can prime additional rounds of amplification. So if you miss, if there's a mispriming reaction and some random gene is, is, is amplified from the start, you will uh, exponentially amplify that misprimed sequence and you will have a ton of con uh, contamination by the end of the experiment. Uh, another source of error is, is primer dimers, where the primers actually dimerize and then they prime the amplification of themselves. So both of these things can be prevented by, by better primer design. So that's going to be the most crucial part of a PCR reaction. <clears throat> RACE stands for Rapid Amplification of cDNA Ends. And is yet an it's another technique that is based on the PCR theory. And there's actually many more as well. The, the RACE version of PCR is used to identify the contents of a gene. So remember, the, the standard genomic sequence of genes is a far cry from what mRNA actually looks like floating around in cells, because not only are introns removed, but exons are sometimes included or not, and sometimes exons from entirely different genes are spliced in. And this creates a situation where the content of the RNA of interest may need to be characterized. For example, say you want to investigate the Huntington gene, and you want to know what the Huntington gene's mRNA commonly looks like. For example, you're curious what what exons are most common, what splicing patterns there might be, etc. And this is how you answer those questions. Uh, you, begin, you begin by first extracting your RNA, or more specifically, in this case, you would be, you'd want to extract mRNA because race is exclusive to characterizing mRNA. And this can be done by taking advantage of the poly, the, uh, the unique poly A tails at the end of the mRNA transcripts because they, they bind to poly T tails. So by, by chemically synthesizing poly T tails and then conjugating, conjugating them to magnetic beads, the mRNA can be precipitated out of solution from the cell lysate. So once you have your purified cell lysate, it's converted to cDNA, and then you add your primers, but with one major difference. Instead of using a five prime in three prime primer like normal, you only get to you only get one gene unique primer, and the other is a universal primer towards poly A tails. So in other words, one primer will be specifically designed towards your gene of interest, perhaps you know like say exon one of Huntington, and the other will be towards all generic poly A tails. So when primers are extended during PCR. Only the gene-specific primer, cDNA, will be exponentially amplified. So you will be amplifying everything in between exon 1 of Huntington and its poly A tail. So when the DNA is enriched, it can be sequenced, and then it can be mapped to the genome to see the, the frequency of each exon in your sample. You might also run the resulting DNA on a, in a gel. We'll discuss that in, in, a, in a little bit. And uh, this would allow the different DNA fragments to be separated out, allowing you to visualize the, the gene species by size. So that's another way to analyze the, the product of a race reaction. <clears throat>
QRT-PCR stands for Quantitative Reverse Transcription Polymerase Chain Reaction. And it can be used to quantify the relative amounts of RNA based on the rate of amplification. So this technique is used to analyze relative gene expression between two or more conditions. We begin with um, RNA extraction from tissue from two groups. Perhaps one tissue was derived from an animal infected with HIV, for example, and the other was not. And the first thing we would do after purifying our RNA is to reverse transcribe it into C DNA. So to do this, we would use the enzyme reverse transcriptase and we would have it reverse transcribed, uh, re reverse transcribe the RNA of our sample into C DNA over the course of an hour or so. And this is done because C DNA is more stable and can be polymerized by our attack polymerase. So reverse transcriptase also needs a primer. So you can either develop primers for your gene of interest, or uh, if you want to test multiple different RNA transcripts, you can do uh, random primers plus a poly A primer, and that can effectively amplify all of the mRNA in your sample. So you can do either of those uh, two routes. Now, with our cDNA, we can run a basic PCR, but with a few a few uh, modifications. So first, our, our master mix containing the primers towards our gene of, of interest, the nucleotides and the TAC polymerase, has, has one new component, and that's going to be cyber green, S-Y-B-R green. Uh, cyber green is basically a, a, a small fluorescent mole, uh, molecule that becomes about 100 times more fluorescent when it's bound to double-stranded double DNA, but not single-stranded DNA. And so maybe you see this where this is going because as our PC react, PCR reaction um, cycles and is doubled after each reaction, the fluorescence intensity will also double after each reaction. And this can be measured in a special thermocycler. So in these qPCR thermocyclers, they not only drive the repeated cycling of temperature, but they also take a snapshot of green fluorescence from cyber green after each round to, to gauge the amount of double-stranded RNA uh, DNA in the mixture. And this means that the sooner that uh, fluorescence becomes detectable, called the CQ value down here, the more starting materials we began with. For example, if we were looking at, say, the Huntington gene, and we started with 100 RNA transcripts, and thus 100 cDNA, we would reach 100,000 double-stranded cDNA after 10 cycles. And that would probably be enough for, for fluorescence to become detectable by cyber green. On the other hand, if we started with only 10 cDNA Huntington transcripts, 10 cycles would only generate 10,000 double-stranded DNA. And that might not, that might be below the detection threshold. So by doing this reaction between two samples, uh, relative gene expression can be quantified based on the rate of cDNA amplification. Also, as a side note, I wanted to add that there are, are multiple technologies used to quantify the amount of double-stranded DNA. And I think cyber green is just the, it's just the example I've used here because it's, it's, it's very straightforward and very simple. Uh, another common method involves using nested primers within your gene of interest that get digested by the polymerase's exonuclease activity. So as your polymerase goes through, it digests it. And these nested primers contain a fluorescence probe that's joined with a quencher. However, when the polymerase uh, digests the, the nested primer, it releases the fluorescent probe from the quencher and this produces fluorescence. So, so that's another way to measure the amount of double-stranded um, DNA in your sample. To conduct a QRT PCR, the first thing you've got to do is design and order some primers towards your gene of interest. And in in, in uh, QRT PCR, you will actually be doing two different PCRs. So you will need two different sets of primers. One set is to reverse transcribe your mRNA into cDNA, 
and one set of primers will be to amplify your cDNA of interest. So once you have your forward and reverse strand primers, you will need to extract your RNA, either total RNA or mRNA. You treat the sample with DNAs to remove any uh, contamination from genomic DNA, and then reverse transcribe all of your, your uh, RNA into cDNA using reverse transcriptase. Now you can, you can either selectively reverse transcribe your gene of interest using a gene-specific primer, or you can, you can use random primers plus a poly-T anchor primer to reverse transcribe all of your mRNA. So this solution allows for more than one gene to be subsequently analyzed if you have enough RNA. So for example, if you wanted to look at the expression of five different genes, you could just amplify all of the mRNA in your sample using that. So once you have reverse transcribed your genes, you want to degrade any residual RNA that survived or is, is left over. So you only want cDNA at this point. And once you have your purified cDNA, you can store it for months at, at minus 20. So you don't immediately need to do your QRT-PCR, but you can save it for another time. So to perform the actual QRT-PCR, it's, it's just a, a very simple PCR, but with you're doing it with cDNA instead of DNA, and you're using CyberGreen to monitor the, the double-stranded uh, DNA concentration. So you're gonna need a special qPCR thermocycler that can monitor uh, fluorescence and thus monitor the amount of double-stranded uh, cDNA in your, in your sample. So PCR is, is an absolutely fundamental technique because as biologists, we know that the gene is the most fundamental unit of a cell. And thus the ability to amplify the gene grants us the ability to manipulate the most basic component of the cell. So I've described only a small subset of the applications for PCR. And I think to fully appreciate the utility of PCR, we have to examine just some of the questions that it could potentially answer. So for example, does my animal have a certain gene? For example, you, if, if you wanna know if your animal or perhaps your human sample is infected with a virus or bacteria, well, you can develop primers towards uh, that gene and see if it amplifies. If there's no significant amplification, then you can be relatively sure your gene is not present. And we'll discuss in a moment how that is confirmed. PCR can also be used to screen for mutations by developing primers that are allele specific and will thus only bind and amplify if the animal or the cell in question contains the mutation. RNA expression, uh, expression can be analyzed by reverse transcribing the starting material into cDNA and assessing how quickly um, the material is amplified, gauged by markers like CyberGreen. Uh, the sequence of your gene can also be deciphered by PCR if, if, it's, if the PCR reaction is conducted in a very careful way. So by adding only one type of DNTP, such as maybe say you're, you're adding adenine, but not any others, and then you can monitor the, the success of that nucleotide to extend your transcript. And then you can sequence, you can sequence your DNA by doing this. So we, right now we have very high throughput and precise genome sequencing methods that are built around this idea. And they're able to detect fluorescence following the addition, the successful addition of a nucleotide to a transcript. And depending on what, on which nucleotide was needed in order to elongate the transcript, they can deduce the sequence of the, uh, of the DNA. Is a certain gene methylated? This can also be answered by using a special primer that is specific for methylated uh, DNA. Uh, want to insert a point mutation? So you can also insert point mutations with PCR, a process called site-directed mutagenesis. And we'll discuss later in this presentation, but it simply involves using a primer that contains a mutation but still retains the ability to bind and prime DNA uh, synthesis. And so by following amplify, uh, amplification of DNA, the DNA will 
uh, contain that original mutation that was de uh, purposefully designed into the primers. Um, and also, just generally, PCR is used to simply amplify DNA or RNA, which has endless possibilities. So many molecular techniques require simply having more DNA or RNA for some particular function. And without PCR, none of them would be possible. So we'll see in this presentation over and over again that amplifying DNA is a very common precursor technique to more advanced methods. So like I said earlier, the, the gene is the most fundamental unit of biology. And you can expect that its manipulation by PCR will also be seen quite often. Gel electrophoresis is another fundamental technique that is used to separate proteins, DNA, or RNA by its size. So for this side, slide, I focused on gels as a means to separate protein, but just remember that DNA and RNA can also be separated with gels. So as a researcher, the first thing you would need to do is simply extract and purify your protein from a crude cell lysate. Now I was going to develop a slide for that, but there's there's about 20 different methods to extract proteins, and each one is designed based on where the protein is located in the cell and what tissue the protein is extracted from, and you know what the protein will be used for in subsequent analysis. So I won't go into specifics in that region, but but often protein extraction requires personal research for your own personal experiment. Anyways, once you have your purified protein, it is common to to want to separate them based on their size. And that is done using gel electrophoresis. The first step requires incubating the protein with SDS or sodium dodecyl sulfate, which gives all of your proteins a uniform negative charge. Right through here, you can see that. Uh, the samples, uh, sorry. So yeah, so it gives them a uniform negative charge and it also denatures them. You see, this is a folded transcript. It becomes linear, linearized, linearized by the SDS. It also has a uniform negative um, uh, charge. So the samples, perhaps you know, from several different animals, are then loaded into wells of an electrophoresis chamber right through here. So in addition to each sample being loaded into a well a very important loading control is added in the first well. This would be a loading control. The loading control contains a mixture of, of uh, proteins of known molecular mass that can be used as a reference for size. So the loading control also contains a, a tracking die that allows all the proteins in the loading control uh, lane to be visualized uh, once they're separated. So this protein dye is not usually added to the experimental wells, because if you did, you would just get a, a big smear across the gel. Um, so we're, we're gonna discuss in the next slide how specific proteins within the experimental lanes are actually um, examined or uh, observed. So once you have your uniform negatively charged uh, proteins that have been loaded into the wells, you then you run an electrical current through the gel with the positively charged anode down here at the opposite end of the loading wells. So this, when you, when you run the electrical current through, this would cause the negatively charged proteins up here coated with SDS to begin migrating through the microscopic pores of this agarose gel. And this allows this would allow smaller proteins to move more quickly through the gel. So once, pro once the proteins are adequately separated based on the visual inspection of the loading control lane, the, the current is then turned off. So if you didn't turn off the, um, if you didn't turn off the, um, the current, the proteins would li literally just run through the, the entire gel and, and there would be nothing left in the gel. And so remember, at this point, after running your, your proteins through, um, the loading, uh, or the, the experimental lanes right through here, they're going to look blank. You, you, the, the only thing visualized on the gel will be the loading control lane. 
So in order to pick out a specific protein within the exper experimental lanes, as they did right here, you need to um, conduct a Western blot. And we're gonna discuss that in the next slide and, and how specific proteins are um, picked out of the gel. So a Western blot is performed to visualize the, the invisible proteins in your gel. So the first step is to transfer all of your proteins onto a nitrocellulose membrane. So that would be this step right here. You're moving it from the agarose gel onto this right here. And this is, oops, sorry. This is the nitrocellulose membrane. And the reason you do this is because the nitrocellulose membrane is permeable to antibodies that can be used to probe for the antigens that you are interested in. So to transfer the proteins from the gel to the, elect to the nitrocellulose membrane, the two are basically sandwiched together uh, with a positive anode placed behind the nitrocellulose membrane. And since the proteins are still coated with SDS, they will be pulled from the gel into the nitrocellulose membrane. So the membrane is then incubated with a solution of antibodies that recognize your protein of interest. So this is basically what's happening right here is that your target protein is being probed with a primary antibody and a secondary antibody which recognizes the primary is added. And the secondary is usually is conjugated to a fluorophore, like you know something like FITSI. This is a um, enzymatic uh, Western blot. I don't think that's done as often uh, nevertheless, the, 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 the membrane is incubated with the solution of antibodies, recognizes your protein of interest. So if you wanted to measure the relative amounts of amyloid beta, for example, you would add an antibody towards amyloid beta. And excess antibody is then washed off of the membrane, and the, the secondary antibody attached to a fluorescent molecule is added that recognizes the primary antibody. So at this point, not only would your target protein now be fluorescent, but its location relative to the loading control can now be uh, compared. So if you are probing for amyloid beta, for example, a, a, this is you know a very small 40 amino acid protein, you should see it perpendicular with the smallest loading control. If you saw fluorescence next to the, the large 200 kilodalton loading control, you would know something went wrong because amyloid beta isn't that big that or you know, possibly amyloid beta was aggregated or something, but you get the point. It's also important to note that a Western blot does not determine uh, absolute protein. It's all relative. So one Western blot cannot be readily compared to another Western blot. Uh, each lane within a Western blot can only be compared to the other wells inside that Western blot, not between experiments. This is because the amount of protein its um, method of, of extraction, its quality, its, its quantity, uh, the quality of the antibodies, all these things can never be exactly controlled for between Western blots. So it's advised that all samples are included in a single Western blot. So uh, for example, if, if you are measuring amyloid beta between nine different animals, don't do three different Western blots with three lanes each, just do one Western blot with uh, nine lanes, and then you can probe all animals in, in a single uh, staining reaction instead of multiple. Another important consideration is whether or not your primary antibody will be capable of recognizing and binding your denatured protein of interest. Because remember, when we put SDS in right here, it denatured our, our proteins. And for some antibodies, that will actually prevent them from recognizing their epitopes and they won't bind. And if denaturing protein, if your denatured protein is not recognized by your antibody, you, you might need to do what's called a native non denaturing gel where the migration towards the anode relies on the intrinsic charge of your protein in high pH deprotonating conditions. To begin a Western blot, the first thing you would probably do is centrifuge your homogenized cell lysate in order to pellet the uh, the DNA and the membranes 
and then you collect the supernatant, which contains the much smaller uh, proteins. Then to, to analyze protein purity, you could do a Bradford, Bradford assay, uh, which is basically involves adding a dye that binds protein called uh, Kumasi blue. And you can check its fluorescence in a, 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 spec, a spectral photometer and to see if you have adequate protein extracted. Um, you then, if, if you have adequate protein, you then load each sample into the wells of an SDS page gel as well as the loading controls. And then you you turn on the, the current and let your proteins begin separating out. So you let your proteins separate out for around an hour or so. And then when they are finished, you remove the gel, you, you transfer the proteins from the gel to a nitrocellulose membrane. Once on this membrane, they are blocked to prevent nonspecific antibody recognition. And you, you typically use uh, serum derived from the um, you use serum derived from the animal that the secondary antibody is derived from. So, or you, there's also commercially available blocking solutions, and it's, it's ultimately just to block non-specific staining. So, you then after you've blocked your your uh, non-specific staining, you incubate the nitrocellulose membrane with a primary antibody. Typically, this is done overnight. The membrane is then washed extensively to get all the excess antibody off. Then you incubate your, your, your membrane in a secondary antibody that recognizes the primary antibody, and then it's washed again. And since the secondary um, was conjugated to a fluorescent molecule, you then image the, the, the membrane in an instrument designed to image Western blot gels, and you detect, you can then detect fluorescence at specific bands, and if that band is in the uh, correct size uh, region or size window, then you know you're looking at your your protein of interest. So I mentioned that RNA and DNA can also be separated by gels, but like protein, the, the contents of the gel are not visible until they are probed for with a fluorescent molecule. However, DNA and RNA are not bound by antibodies in this case. Instead, they are probed for using antisense oligonucleotides that have been labeled. So like proteins, uh, nucleic acid can be separated based on charge, which is done by altering the, the pH and deprotonating the phosphate backbone. So it's negatively charged. So we're not going to be using uh, SDS to separate RNA and DNA. We can simply use the intrinsic uh, charge by um, lowering the pH. Once the, or sorry, uh, increasing the pH, so we deprotonate the the phosphate backbone of the nucleic acid. So once the nucleic acid is is separated in the gel, it's transferred to a nitrocellulose membrane, as usual, and then it's probed using oligonucleotides that are fluorescently labeled. So the question is, where do these oligonucleotides come from and how are they made fluorescent? Well, the, the oligonucleotides need to be antisense to your gene of interest. So if you're investigating the amount of Huntington RNA, you would need to generate RNA that is complementary and antisense to Huntington RNA so they can bind. To do this, you can amplify by asymmetric PCR, your gene of interest from a cell lysate, an asymmetric PCR means the PCR is designed in such a way that only the antisense transcript is amplified. In addition to this, the, the PCR involved in probe generation requires the use of, of special nucleotides. Sometimes the nucleotides will be radioactive so that the resulting antisense probes will be radioactive and they can later be measured in an auto radiographic chamber. Uh, more often, the nucleotides will be attached to a molecule called biotin. It's a special antigen that can be recognized by a protein called uh, streptavidin that can be conjugated to a fluorescent antibody. Other times, the nucleotides will contain a reactive amino group that can be conjugated to a fluorescent dye. Um, oftentimes, however, a lab won't even bother making their own hybridization probes because they've gotten so cheap in the market and 
commercials uh, from uh, commercial suppliers, that's actually probably a better idea to simply order the fluorescent oligonucleotides uh, pre-synthesized from outside labs. Regardless of how you get these labeled fluorescent antisense probes uh, called hybridization probes, um, once they're generated with either radioactive nucleotides or with biotin groups sticking off the backbone, whatever, they are, they are added to the nitrocellulose gel containing our size separated nucleic acid. The probes will hybridize with their complementary sequences and the excess probes, fluorescent probes, will be washed out. And then the fluorescence or the radioactivity will be used to quantify relative amounts of nucleic acid between two different samples. So a, a, a northern blot is designed to specifically uh, detect RNA and thus can be used to quantify gene expression similar to a QRT-PCR. A southern blot, on the other hand, is used to quantify DNA and can be used to identify the presence of a gene, perhaps from a microorganism or a virus. Oftentimes, a southern blot is done after a qPCR to confirm that the amplified gene is indeed the gene that was that the original primers were, were designed towards. For example, just because primers towards the HIV gene uh, amplified a sequence uh, uh, to the point where it could be detected in a qPCR, that doesn't necessarily prove that the sequence the sequence was HIV. So it, it you know it could for example be an off-target amplification. So to confirm the identity of an amplified uh, transcript by PCR, it's often subjected to a southern blot with a highly sequence specific probe just to confirm that the uh, the amplified transcript was the the your your original gene of interest. The immunofluorescence assay, also sometimes called the uh, immunohistochemistry, from where the technique was derived from, is basically a Western blot on tissue. So instead of extracting the protein, separating it, and labeling it with antibodies, why not just label the tissue with the antibodies? and see where they are in the tissue. So this approach to protein analysis, as opposed to a Western blot, lets you see the actual location of the protein in your tissue. Although I should note that if you are interested only in quantifying relative expression of a protein, it would, it would probably be easier and more simple to do, do a Western blot. Uh, IFA or immunofluorescence assays are, are primarily used for visualization of a protein's cellular location and, and is less useful as a means to quantify protein expression. To, to begin an IFA experiment, the, the tissue is first extracted and immediately fixed in formaldehyde, which preserves the protein and cellular structure. Sometimes animals from which an IFA experiment will be conducted are anesthetized and perfused with fixative to fix the tissue literally as the animal is dying. The fixed tissue is then cut into very thin sections, anywhere from one micron to 50 microns. For an idea of how thin that is, a typical cell is about 50 to, or 30 to 50 microns thick. To make sections this thin, the tissue is often permeated with paraffin wax, which makes it very stable and can be cut into five micron sections. Other times, uh, sections will be generated from frozen tissue in a cryostat. The sections are mounted onto uh, microscope slides and then stained using a very similar procedure done in the Western blots. I won't go into specific details yet, but it basically involves an initial blocking solution to obstruct or, or block nonspecific antigens. You can see that going on over here. Uh, a primary antibody towards your Protein of interest is then added and incubated for an hour or so, sometimes overnight. Uh, excess antibody is washed out and a secondary antibody, secondary fluorescent antibody is then added that recognizes the primary antibody and then excess is washed out. The end result will be, a, will be basically fluorescent tissue that when visualized under a fluorescent microscope will show you where your protein of interest is located. The most crucial aspect to designing an IFA experiment is getting the antibodies correct. 
especially if you want to visualize two proteins at once. So for example, if, if you want to visualize actin and myosin in a single section, you need to be very careful in how you pick your antibodies. So you would want an anti-actin antibody, let's say from a mouse, that will be your primary antibody. Now your secondary antibody would need to be an antibody towards, would need to be a mouse antibody, perhaps derived from a horse, and it would be conjugated to a green dye. Now your, your second primary antibody to recognize myosin cannot be from a mouse, because if both your primary antibodies were from a mouse, the horse green dye would be labeling both actin and myosin, and you wouldn't be able to differentiate which is which. So your other primary antibody towards myosin needs to be from a different species, like a goat. But now, since you have a goat antibody, you need another secondary fluorescent antibody towards a goat primary antibody. An, ant <laughs> an anti-goat secondary antibody derived from a horse could be used, and it would be conjugated to a dye that is unique, perhaps a red dye. So I hope that, ma that made sense. It's, it's kind of confusing, and it, it helps to, to write it out and look at it and it's hard to just learn just simply by listening. But, but basically you have two primaries from different species and two secondaries from the same species, but they recognize different species. That's definitely confusing, I understand that. But just remember that designing a dual labeling experiment in IFA, it takes a pen and paper and, it, and making sure you're ordering the correct antibodies. So it's important to, to, to be aware of that. Anyways, once you have your, your antibodies bound in labeling your antigens, the slide is mounted using DAPI usually, which is a fluorescent dye that labels nuclei. And, and it also preserves the slide for analysis. Uh, you then cover slip and your, your slide is ready for imaging in a, a fluorescent microscope. There are a couple of different methods to prepare tissue for IFA, but the, the gold standard is paraffin embedding, so I'll focus on that here. So we begin by fixing our tissue in formalin, either during perfusion or after tissue harvesting. It's dropped into formalin for about 24 hours. Once the tissue is fixed, but not overfixed, it's, it's prepared for paraffinization, first by dehydrating the tissue in ethanol for several hours. This removes the water from the, the uh, specimen, which allows an agent called xylene to enter the tissue. And the reason we want xylene in the tissue is that it's miscible or it can mix with paraffin wax. So in a, in a special machine, our sample tissue will be covered with molten paraffin and it will permeate through our tissue block and then be dried overnight. This hardened paraffin embedded tissue is, is very stable and it can be stored for years. And when ready, it can be sectioned at five microns, typically five microns anyways. The, the five micron sections are mounted onto a slide when they are ready to be stained. Um, they actually need to be de-paraffinized by reversing steps one through four. So once the tissue has been de-paraffinized, the sections are placed into a rice cooker and heated to around 90 degrees for 20 or so minutes in a process called antigen recovery. The tissue is then blocked in 10% serum and BSA for an hour and then stained with primary antibodies. If we were doing dual fluorescence, we might use, uh, for example, mouse anti-Huntington and goat anti-myosin, in addition to one of these slides being a no primary control. Uh, the secondary antibodies, such as horse anti-goat, or sorry, horse anti-mouse conjugated to red and horse anti-goat conjugated to green is added. It's incubated for about an hour and then washed off. And then finally, our slides are washed and mounted with DAPI to stain the nuclei and preserve the fluorescent signal. And it's, these slides would then be ready for imaging. So the controls for an IFA experiment are especially important because when adding a fluorescent antibody to tissue, you are exposing the, these antibodies to hundreds of thousands of epitopes or binding sites. The potential for nonspecific binding can completely throw off your experiment. So 
it's a big question. So, so how does an experimenter know that the fluorescence that they are seeing is indeed from the protein they are interested in? So there are several types of controls that can be used in conjunction with each other. With, with each other. Uh, the most common control is a no primary control, where in one of these staining procedures, everything is exactly this, the same except one critical thing. There is there's no primary antibody added. So any resulting fluorescence would indicate the secondary fluorescent antibody binding non-specifically and staining things that are not the, not the primary antibody because the primary antibody is absent. Another common control that is used during dual labeling experiments to make sure there's no cross reactivity is an isotype, isotype control. This is where a primary antibody that is not compatible with a fluorescent secondary antibody is added. So for example, if you have a horse anti-mouse secondary antibody, use a goat primary antibody. If the horse anti-mouse antibody is binding the goat primary antibody, you know there's something wrong because there's cross reactivity and thus there should be, and thus there may be cross reactivity in your dual labeling experiment because a horse anti-goat should not be binding to a goat um, sorry, no, a, a horse anti-mouse should not be binding to a goat primary antibody. And so this is known as an isotype control. Uh, the two other controls that are more intuitive and easier to perform are simply staining tissue. You are absolutely sure contains or does not contain the antigen you are looking for. So a negative control would involve staining a tissue you are completely sure does not contain your antigen. An example would be staining for a bacterium in an animal you have not infected with the bacterium. Any resulting fluorescence would thus indicate either, either you accidentally infected that animal with the bacterium, and thus needs to be seriously, you know, you seriously need to rethink your organizational skills, or there is off-target fluorescence coming from either the primary or the secondary binding non-specifically. In contrast, a positive control involves staining a tissue you are absolutely positive contains the antigen. An example would be staining the lymph nodes of an SIV infected monkey for SIV. And we know for a fact that SIV accumulates in the lymph nodes of, of monkeys. So if there's a lack of fluorescence in the lymph nodes in an animal you know you infected, then you know the antibody is not working or, or you know perhaps something else in the process has gone wrong. And now a lot of these controls also work with other experiments that rely on antibodies, like Western blots, for example, will sometimes you will see no primary controls or isotype controls, positive and negative controls. Um, these general ideas are applicable to many other um, different techniques. Once we have our stained tissue, how is it actually visualized and imaged? Well, we obviously want to use a microscope, but it can't be any ordinary microscope because in order to excite the fluorophores on our protein of interest, we need to generate a laser of the correct wavelength. So we need a fluorescent microscope capable of both exciting and capturing the uh, correct wavelengths of light. This involves two main systems. One, we need to generate a very specific wavelength of light, and this is done by the use of an uh, excitation filter that blocks all wavelengths of light except for a very specific wavelength um, that we want to shine on our specimen. For example, if we want to excite the green Fitzy fluorophore in our sample, we would want to block all wavelengths of light except 450 uh, nanometers from reaching our specimen. The Fitzy molecules are then excited by the 450 nanometer light passing through the excitation filter and then they emit photons at 550 nanometers, which is green. In order to only capture the resulting green light, we would want a second filter that only lets photons at 550 nanometers to pass through. And this is called the emissions filter. So that is a very basic how a, a fluorescent microscope works. You have two fluorescence filters that direct specific light and then they capture specific light. The problem with this, however, is that if you have a thick specimen 
say 25 or 50 microns, you're going to be exciting all layers of that section when you image it. And so it will just be super blurry for the most part. And that's what we're seeing here in this second illustration without this pinhole right here. You can see light from every plane of the specimen being collected by the eyepiece. And, and this creates ultimately a blurry image because you're, you're getting light from both the surface of the cell, the interior of the cell, and the bottom of the cell. So the confocal, the fluorescent confocal microscope is, is what was a significant improvement that helped correct this problem. And it has two main components. First of all, it has an extremely small pinhole that, it, that the light is funneled through and it blocks out of focus light. So you can see in this illustration that the, the red line representing out of focus light is, is, is blocked by this pinhole because it's not in the right <clears throat> it's not in the right imaging plane so only the blue light is collected this poses a second problem however because as the pinhole gets smaller all the, although the, the focal resolution gets better it also reduces the number of photons that are being collected <clears throat> so the pinhole restricts light to a very specific area of the specimen but also significantly reduces the intensity of the light. And this problem is overcome by a photomultiplier too, which does exactly what it sounds like. It amplifies the fluorescent signal such that a few hundred photons are amplified into a th you know, thousands so we can actually detect the fluorescent signal from small regions of our sample. This allows thick tissue to be imaged plane by plane taking sectional images from our tissue section. It's really quite amazing. However, there's a big constraint because fluorophores are not stable and their fluorescence intensity decreases over time called photo bleaching. In both tissue size and tissue quality, uh, both increase the time it takes to, to take the image and, and thus it increases the amount of, of bleaching that might occur. So it's, it's always, there's always trade trade-offs in, in microscopy and, this, and that is one of them. Two photon microscopy is probably my favorite technique that allows researchers to image even deeper into tissue up to one millimeter or one, you know, a thousand microns. And it, and it can be used to image live animals. So how is this miracle accomplished? You, you can see, in the image to the right, a laser being excited at only this one pinpoint region in space. The secret lies in the use of two separate lasers that are converging at this single point in space. Right here, they'd be converging right at this location. Now, the, the fluorophore, in this case, would be a green fluorophore, which requires around 488 to be excited. As you can see that happening in panel A. So if you, if you were to just shoot down a laser that was at 488, it would be exciting everything before the focal plane and even after the focal plane. It's exciting everything. Or a, a more uh, intelligent way to go about this is you could have two lasers emitting at half that frequency, which would be uh, 960. So a lower energy laser at 960 is unable to excite the fluorophores by itself. But when you have two lasers that converge at this single point, their collective intensity will be enough to excite the fluorophore at 488. And then photons are released from this one area. Although this technique requires a super expensive microscope, it is nonetheless a very impressive technique. So the, the, the two photon mic, uh, microscope works great in brain tissue because not only do lasers at nine, uh, 960 not excite anything by themselves, but green fluorescence travels actually very far in brain tissue such that the fluorophores excited deep in brain tissue can be collected by lenses on the surface of the brain. So now you're probably wondering how do fluorophores get into the brain in the first place? Well, we're going to discuss this more later, but it, it's through it's done through genetic engineering and by attaching 
our protein of interest to a fluorescent protein like GFP. Uh, so not only can fluorescent proteins be attached to other proteins, but calcium sensitive fluorescent proteins can also be made inside the cell that allows in vivo visualization of action potentials. Because remember, action potentials are marked by the influx of calcium. So this special protein called uh, G-CAMP, this is, this is G-CAMP down here. It's a GFP fluorophore that can only be activated during a transient flux of calcium. So through methods like this, proteins can be watched in real time, deep inside the brain, uh, being activated. And so I included this video here and see if I can get it to work. So this can be up to a thousand microns in a living animal's uh, brain as it's doing a task. For example, you could have it walking around, be imaging. You could have it uh, watching a movie. They have actually done this where they have mice watching a, a movie and they are recording the activity of neurons in the visual cortex. Some other fluorescence techniques that are very useful include FRET and FRAP. And these techniques require some, some serious patience and, and some, some very careful planning. So FRET stands for Forrester Resonance Energy Transfer, also called, uh, I, I call it Fluorescence Resonance Energy Transfer. So this technique is used to visualize protein-protein uh, protein -protein interactions at a molecular level, which is unique in terms of microscopy techniques. FRET, FRET is based on the idea of energy transfer, or more, more specifically, the energy transfer between two fluorophores. The idea is that, that you have two fluorophores, like GFP and BFP, or blue fluorescence protein, that are attached or fused to two different proteins that are suspected to be interacting. And one fluorophore, BFP, can be excited at 380 nanometers of photons, which then emits at 450 nanometers. This 450 nanometer emission, however, is not picked up by the microscope. Instead, this 450 nanometer emission from BFP excites GFP fluorophores, which then emit at 510. And our emission filter will be set up to collect at 510 uh, nanometers of light. So we have this, this chain reaction. Our excitation filter will be shooting through UV light at 380 this excites BFP, which emits at 450 to excite GFP, which emits at 510, which is allowed to get past our emission filter and is collected. So the ability for GFP to excite GFP molecules is dependent on proximity. Only BFP molecules that are very close, within about five nanometers, are able to excite GFP molecules. So if we shine UV light at 380, and then collect light at 510, it means that our two fluorophores and thus our proteins fused to them must be in close proximity for that reaction to be happening. Another cool uh, fluorescence assay is FRAP for fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. And this technique actually capitalizes on the ability of a laser to bleach fluorophores and then measures the time it takes for the fluorescence to return due to simple diffusion of surrounding fluorescent molecules. FRAP is commonly applied to monitoring membrane dynamics. So after adding a membrane specific dye that labels all the membrane, a very localized and intense laser is used to bleach an area of the live cell. And the time it takes for the bleached area to recover uh, indicates how quickly adjacent fluorescent lipids are diffusing into the bleached area. So the concept of FRAP, however, can be applied to measure transport or turnover dynamics. For example, a fluorescently tagged protein could be photo bleached in dendrites. And then the time it takes for the fluorescence to recover could indicate uh, the diffusion or perhaps translation of new fluorescent protein in the dendrite. Also, if you photo bleached microtubules along an axon, you could maybe measure the time it takes for microtubules to be turned over. So it's a fascinating technique that's, that's based simply on the diffusion of fluorescently labeled probes. And, and it's also uh, an in vivo process. So you, you couldn't do this in vitro 
the the last fluorescence uh, microscopy based technique that I wanted to hit is is called fish or fluorescence in situ hybridization. The the idea basically combines a northern blot and an immu immunofluorescence assay. So in other words, we are visualizing the subcellular location of RNA or DNA in tissue by the hybridization of fluorescently labeled probes. So like a northern blot, the first thing we need to consider is how to generate the probes. So we might begin by extracting and purifying DNA and then amplifying the antisense transcript towards your gene of interest uh, using, these, using some sequence specific primers. And when we do this, we don't use regular nucleotides. We use, you know, something like a radio labeled nucleotide, maybe a nucleotide with reactive amino groups that can be bound by fluorescent dyes or nucleotides that are uh, biotinylated. And they can be, and, and there are many other methods for labeling probes. But let's just say that we produce probes with uh, biotinylated backbones. Once we generate these probes, we need to prepare the tissue to be incubated with the probes. And the first step, like immunofluorescence assays, is to fix the tissue and preserve cellular integrity. The tissue is then sectioned into thin five micron sections, sometimes thinner because oligonucleotides don't diffuse very well in tissue. And finally, the tissue is incubated with our fluorescent probes. And in order to permit hybridization, the procedure is conducted at 42 degrees uh, Celsius to melt endogenous duplexes. After a lengthy incubation period, the excess probes are washed off and any remaining probes are presumably hybridized with their, their sense transcript. For final visualization of a fluorescent, uh, for final vi visualiz visualization, a fluorescently tagged antibody directed towards biotin on the backbone of our labeled probes is added and incubated with the tissue. And so if we began with antisense Huntington probes, any remaining labeled probes in our tissue should be Huntington mRNA. And thus, thus te this technique allows sub uh, subcellular localization of mRNA, although it can also be applied to DNA. But generally, this the, the subcellular location of DNA is not as interesting to look at, although in some cases it can be. But just to emphasize, this technique is, is not about necessarily quantifying the amount of DNA or RNA, but rather it's about checking where the transcript is located. If as a researcher you want to see how much DNA or RNA is in your sample, you, you probably wouldn't do a FISH. You would, you would simply do a northern blot or a QRT-PCR. FISH is used to see exactly where your mRNA is found, uh, if that is of interest to you. So this technique is, is most common in embryology, for example, to see when and where a certain gene is expressed uh, during development. A, a FISH experiment, since, since we're working with fragile RNA, typically begins by flash freezing your tissue as quickly as possible. But it can also be done from paraffin embedded tissue as well. So the tissue is sectioned into very thin five micron sections inside of a cryostat to keep the temperature low while sectioning. The, the sections are stored until they're ready to be stained. And that begins by, by thawing the tissue and then fixing the mounted sections in formaldehyde for maybe around 15 minutes. These sections are then dehydrated in ethanol and then stained with uh, fluorescent probes towards your gene of interest. So these probes, again, they can be made in many different ways. In this example, I use the amino allyl uh, UTP nucleotides that once they are used, um, once they're, they are made by PCR, your, your antisense gene of interest, they, they can be reacted with amino sensitive fluorescent dyes. So basically you can add these little dyes that will react with amino groups. And when you add it to your uh, uh, amino allyl UTP uh, synthesized transcript, it will label those uh, antisense transcripts. It's also important to note that there are many commercial suppliers of commercial probe or of fluorescent probes that can be purchased to save time and to minimi minimize potential error. Uh, um, 
I believe ordering fluorescent probes has actually become the standard approach to acquiring hybridization probes for both fish and for other things like northern blotting, simply because they're, they're cheap and it's more dependable and it, it's just become such a streamlined process in biotechnology that it's just easier to order them usually. Anyways, the fluorescent probes are incubated overnight in your, uh, your slides at around 40 degrees Celsius, and this promotes hybridization. Afterwards, excess probes are vigorously washed out. Sometimes um, any excess probes in the specimen are degraded by adding RNase, and, this, and then the slide is then dehydrated again, and then it's mounted with uh, something like DAPI to visualize the, the, the nuclei. Um, at this point, the slides are then ready for imaging, and any fluorescence should indicate antisense probe hybridization, and thus the location of your gene. Fluorescence in vivo hybridization is a very new technique that is still being perfected, but it's basically the ability to monitor mRNA in vivo in real time using these fancy hybridization probes. So researchers for a long time have been able to monitor proteins in vivo by simply fusing them to GFP but monitoring mRNA or nucleic acid has always been a challenge because it can't simply be conjugated to GFP and it's, it's much less abundant than its pro, uh, protein counterpart. Conventional fish probes also can't be used either because they would just light up the entire specimen because you can't wash off excess probes from a live cell. So instead, researchers needed to develop conditionally active probes. And this was done by developing a short hairpin RNA probe that while <clears throat> in this short hairpin structure, seen down here, uh, it, it, it would um, bring together a fluorescent quencher and the fluorescent probe. So these probes in this native state are auto inhibited and they do not emit photons. However, when a complementary sequence is nearby or encountered, it causes the hairpin to unravel and hybridize, and this separates the fluorescent probe from its quencher, allowing fluorescence to be emitted. Now there's a big problem of signal because a single probe is not gonna be bright enough. And since each probe can only bind a specific sequence, if an mRNA is gonna be adequately illuminated, you're gonna need several probes or special, several species of probes that recognize different parts along your mRNA of interest. But the, the end result, if, if you work out all the kinks, is that you, you might get something like this. This is a video of a, a single mRNA being transported along an axon. Okay, so the, the last microscopy technique I want to talk about is immunogold electron microscopy. It's, it's a combination of antibodies and transmission electron microscopy. So in order to prepare the tissue for transmission electron microscopy, it, it needs to be uh, exceptionally thin because electrons do not transverse tissue very well like photons do. And a thicker section would just look black because electrons wouldn't be transmitting through the specimen. So in order to section uh, tissue at one micron, which is how thin it needs to be, a kind of super fixative called uh, glutaraldehyde is used, and the tissue is then embedded in a plastic resin. And then during sectioning, an ultra sharp diamond tip knife is used. So you can imagine this kind of treatment interfere, interferes with antibody binding, and indeed it does. And oftentimes for immunogold experiments, the, the tissue will be sectioned twice and stained in between. For example, a tissue may be sectioned at 25 microns, stained with immunogold conjugated antibodies, and then refixed, embedded in plastic, and then sectioned at one micron. Another pretreatment that is done to improve contrast between the membrane and the cytoplasm is, is, is lead citrate. It's an electron dense dye that uh, preferentially stains membrane but not proteins or cytoplasm. And this allows the boundaries of membranes to, uh, uh, to be visualized during microscopy. So the end result will be 
will be outlined membranes in your protein of interest conjugated to an antibody that is itself conjugated to a, a relatively huge 20 nanometer gold particle. So these huge gold particles stick out like sore thumbs because they block and reflect, reflect the transmission of electrons through that region of the specimen. And this technique can achieve single protein resolution, which I personally just find amazing. Uh, the caveat is that transmission electron microscopy costs about half a million dollars and requires very special maintenance and housing. And the, and, and the sample preparation itself can be really difficult and, and often requires a lot of trial and error. For example, sectioning at 0.5 or 1 micron is, is a very difficult process that, that takes uh, a lot of practice. But in, in the end, the, the images you get are just absolutely amazing. This slide details the typical workflow of an immunogold staining procedure. So we begin with a thick section of you know, 50 microns and is collected in free-floating PBS, where it is first pre-treated in a solution of, of uh, sodium bor borohydride or glycine. And this is used to block endogenous aldehyde groups that are known to non-specifically link and cross-react with antibodies. And since we're, we're going to be looking at single antibody resolution, we need to be extremely stringent uh, about blocking reactions like this. So after blocking, we incubate our slide in a solution of primary antibody overnight. And th the section is washed and then incubated in a gold conjugated secondary antibody. The, the section is then washed again and fixed in our super fixative glutaraldehyde. The, the gold particles are then enhanced by silver treatment, which collects, uh, will collect around the, the gold particles and makes them even larger and more reflective to incoming electrons. The tissue is, is then dehydrated in ethanol and then embedded in plastic, allowing it the stability um, to be sectioned at 0.5 microns and mounted onto uh, electron microscopy grids. Well, they're not slides, they're, they're called grids. It's also counterstained at this point with lead citrate, which stains membrane with electrons, allowing some visualization of contrast. And finally, the sections um, are then ready to be, to be uh, mounted and imaged, and you get that single antibody resolution that's so amazing. LISA, which stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay is basically an immunofluorescence assay in a 96-well plate. So there are multiple approaches, so I'm just going to cover the two most common methods. Uh, one is called the sandwich method and begins by immobilizing your primary antibodies towards whatever protein you are interested in at the bottom of a well in the 96-well plate. Uh, when your cell lysate is added and incubated, the the target antigens will be pulled down and will remain in the well after washing. So you see the cell lysate by these brown particles, they've been pulled down now in the well. Uh, then you add your fluorescent antibodies towards your protein of interest to see if the immobilized primary antibodies successfully pulled down your protein of interest. So that's why it's called the sandwich methods because we're, we're sandwiching your uh, ant your your anti or, um, protein of interest between two antibodies. Another similar method involves immobilizing uh, your cell lysate in the wells. You see down here, this is represents your cell lysate being immobilized at the bottom of the wells. You're doing that instead of immobilizing a primary antibody. And then you're probing the immobilized uh, lysate using the conventional combination of a primary antibody followed by a fluorescently tagged secondary antibody. So since we're probing for our target antigen in a 96 well plate, uh, we, we commonly assay the resulting fluorescence in a microplate reader, which is, is simply an instrument to measure the absorbance at particular wavelengths of light. And it does this for each well. So each sample, or you know, we could have each animal be a, a different well and so we can really get a lot of data out of one of these microplate readers uh, reading our data from an ELISA experiment. 
Coimmunoprecipitation, or simply CoIP, is a very common method used to identify protein-protein interactions. So the process begins by first precipitating your uh, protein of interest. This is done by conjugating a primary antibody to an immobilized bead at the bottom of a test tube. So when a cell lysate is incubated in the test tube and subsequently the supernatant is washed out, only your protein of interest plus any proteins in complex with it will be pulled down. Typically the bead to antibody conjugation is accomplished by ordering beads that are conjugated to these special bacterial proteins called protein A or protein G. They are proteins that have a high affinity to antibodies. And so any antibody that you incubate with these protein A conjugated beads will be, uh, will be picked up and conjugated to the beads. So you can essentially put any antibody that you might own and attach it to these beads uh, through kind of like what you're seeing right here, you can conjugate to these little cephalose or agarose beads to your antibody, and then you can put it into a test tube with your cell lysate and it'll begin pulling down your protein of interest. And you can see these other proteins like this one right here, this is not getting pulled down because it, it doesn't uh, contain your uh, protein of interest. And then when you wash out the, the supernatant and the unbound fraction that is not precipitated at the bottom, you will only have your protein of interest plus any proteins that you that, that are uh, associated with your protein of interest. Alternatively, you can also, um, if your protein of interest contains a fusion tag or an epitope tag like GST or uh, glutathione, then you can order beads that are conjugated to GSH, which binds with high affinity to GST. So it's not just antibodies that are used to pull down and precipitate your protein of interest. It kind of depends on uh, your specific experimental setup. In panel H, we see an example of a typical CoIP experiment that was done to confirm the interaction between these two proteins called PID and NPM1. So in panel H, the, the researchers used beads conjugated to an antibody towards PID. So that's what they're saying right here. They're saying we use an antibody for immunoprecipitation. We use the PID antibody to do that precipitation. And the resulting protein complexes that were pulled down were run in this uh, this SDS page, which is you know a, a Western blot, and then they stained for uh, MPM1. So using an antibody towards PID, they were able to pull down MPM1 only in this condition, the CPT condition. So these are three different conditions that the cells were treated in. It's not necessarily doesn't necessarily matter what they are, but you can see MPM1 was only pulled down in this CPT uh, condition because you see a band right here. And this band was created by an immunoblot or a Western blot towards MPM1. So they use an antibody towards PID and then they stain for a different protein. So this indicates that MPM1 was in complex with PID when it was pulled down in the co-immunoprecipitation. Then to further confirm this reaction, you can do the basically the opposite, uh, opposite co-immunoprecipitation. You can use an antibody towards MPM1 to pull down everything in the cell lysate and then stain for PID in the Western blot. You can see, you also see a band right here in the, again, this is the same CPT condition, but not in the others, not necessarily relevant, but you can see that the, uh, the Western blot shows up a positive for PID staining, indicating that again, PID is interacting with MPM1 and MPM1 is interacting with PID. So there's also a high throughput take on this method. It involves taking all of the proteins pulled down by a single antibody and then identifying them by mass spectrometry, which we're, we're gonna discuss what mass spectrometry is in a second. But it's basically a method to sequence a mixture of protein. And so this method would allow a researcher to basically identify the entire interactum of a protein by sequencing all of the proteins co-immunoprecipitated by its antibody. So this me method isn't generally as precise as a CoIP followed by a Western blot like we're, what we see here, but it's a good starting point to identify potential interactions that a researcher might want to further scrutinize. Uh, when this method is done for Huntington, for example, it identifies like 500 interacting proteins, which by itself isn't super helpful, but you know it, it can serve as a good starting point for a, um, a more precise uh, CoIP followed by a Western blot. 
Since a co-IP is such a critical process that also encompasses a Western blot, it, it's, I, I want to go through the typical workflow. So the typical workflow of a co-IP uh, begins by extracting all of your protein as usual, and then incubating your protein lysate with an antibody towards your protein of interest. Then you take these, these agarose beads. So at this point, you're, you're gonna have um, a cell lysate, all your proteins, with your primary antibody bound to your protein of interest. That's what you have so far. And then you, you, you take these um, agarose beads that are commercially purchased and pre-conjugated to protein A. And this causes the beads to bind strongly to any antibodies. And so when we add these beads to our, our antibody protein mixture, all of the antibodies and their associated binding targets will get pulled down out of solution. So we then uh, centrifuge the beads, we wash and discard all of the unbound supernatant. And we, we so at this point, we all we have left are beads conjugated to protein A, which is conjugated to our antibodies, which are conjugated to our protein complexes. And then at this point, we, we elute all of the remaining proteins. So this protein elutant, which 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 means we're we're unbinding everything and letting it flow out of the test tubes, we we elute um, our complexes, and then we identify the uh, the proteins in the complex by Western blot using an antibody not towards not towards your original protein, but towards some other protein you suspect is interacting with it. For example. If you used an, a primary antibody towards Huntington in step two, you might want to use an antibody towards TIM23 in your Western blot to see if it was pulled down uh, along with Huntington. And that would give you evidence for interaction between Huntington and TIM23. Affinity chromatography has a lot in common with CoIP in that the basic idea is that immobilized beads conjugated to some protein such as an antibody, a receptor, a ligand, will bind and pull down a target protein. However, instead of precipitating the protein in like a test tube, affinity chromatography relies on preventing our protein of interest from flowing through a liquid column. So we begin with this column of beads that are, have been experimentally conjugated to some protein. It could be an antibody, could be a recombinant protein receptor, like an insulin receptor, or you know, it could be whatever. And then when the beads are uh, stacked in this column, we run through our crude cell lysate. So this would be our mixture of protein or our cell lysate. And, and we run our cell lysate through this and non-interacting proteins will run right on through the column, basically. And it will be eluded in here and they'll be discarded. Once all the junk has eluded through, we can then put a, a new collection tube underneath. So we, we change what we're uh, the collection tube. And then we, we um, elute our protein of interest using a very low pH buffer. So we're going to be pouring in a, a very low pH to elute what has been bound. And the low pH running through the column will dissociate our proteins of interest from their interacting ligand or, or antibody and cause them to fall into our collection tube. Um, now the structure of an uh, in a, a affinity chromatography experiment can vary greatly because the beads that contain the ligand can be almost anything. So oftentimes they're simply conjugated to an antibody towards our protein of interest. But sometimes a, a super purification system is set up beforehand, before the experiment is even conducted for, for a very quick and easy purification of our target protein. This is done by fusing our gene of interest to something like GST. You can see this, this will be our protein and it's fused to this GST. Or, or, or something like a polyhistidine tag, that would be another example. So these fusion tags that can be engineered to your protein of interest allow for easy purification by affinity chromatography because they interact very strongly with certain beads. So you can have a, a bead with a polyhistidine tag, for example, that will bind with extremely high affinity to nickel ions. And uh, GST tags, like what we see in this, this image, uh, bind with super high affinity to uh, glutathione or GSH. So by planning ahead, you can basically make your life much easier and make purifying your protein of interest a uh, really quick and easy.
And ordering beads pre-conjugated to nickel ion, ions or GSH makes life even easier because um, you don't have to manually conjugate the beads or anything like that. You just you just order them. You order some uh, uh, glutathione conjugated beads and then mix your crude cell lysate with these beads uh, in a in a in a column, and uh, and then elute it when you when you're ready. And everything that will be eluted will be mostly just your protein of interest. And so this uh, affinity chromatography is a great way to um, easily separate out your, your protein of interest. Mass spectrometry is an incredibly powerful technique of analyzing and sequencing a mixture of proteins. So mass spec is, is thus used to identify the species of protein that have been partially purified by a technique such as co-immunoprecipitation or affinity chromatography or gel electrophoresis. You can't just put in a, a crude cell lysate, it needs to be at least somewhat uh, purified. So once you have a, a simplified, I would I call it a simplified sample, you would check for protein concentration and quality with something like a Bradford assay. Then to prepare your sample for mass spec, the, the protein sample is reduced, it's in, um, alkylated, and then it's uh, digested into smaller, uh, more manageable fragments. The treated protein sample is then simply loaded into the mass spectrometer and then when the machine is run, your sample is shot down this vacuum where it encounters a, a high energy um, electron beam that ionizes your sample. And uh, so, so it's basically knocking off all of these electrons from, from all of your peptides and all your proteins. So these ionized proteins are then accelerated and they're deflected by these magnets. And this is where the, the separation by mass actually occurs because uh, lighter peptide fragments are deflected to a, a, a greater degree than, than large peptides. And so when the ionized peptides are picked up by this detector down here, um, their position is, is, is then a proxy for their size because peptides that are hitting the edge of the detector must be lighter because they were significantly deflected by the, by the magnets. So the amount of deflection is proportional to the size of the peptide fragments and when these ions collide with the detector, the information is fed into a computer and, and the kind of data that you might get might look something like this, where you have relative abundance on the Y axis and then you have the mass to charge ratio on, on the X axis. So this is a, a real world example of the kind of output you get from a mass spectrometry experiment. So this graphic is from Schilling et al, who are looking at or looking to use mass spectrometry to map the phosphorylation sites of the Huntington protein. So to do this, they, they first began by extracting and, and purifying the Huntington protein by a combination of uh, gel electrophoresis followed by affinity chromatography. And then they, they, put the, they, they input this purified sample into the mass spectrometer. So by inputting a known sequence and then mapping both the, the mass to charge ratios and uh, uh, the mass to charge ratios of each fragment and and as well as the relative intensities of the of um so this is a real world example of the kind of output you can get from a mass spectrometry experiment so the graphic is from uh Schilling et al who were using we're looking to use mass spectrometry to map the phosphorylation sites of the Huntington protein so to do this they first began by extracting and purifying the Huntington protein by a combination of gel electrophoresis followed by affinity chromatography. And then, and then inputting this purified sample into the, into the mass spectrometer. So by inputting a known sequence and then mapping both the mass to charge ratios and each fragment's uh, relative intensities, a, a, uh, a computer algorithm is then able to deduce the identity of each fragment. So I'm not confident or knowledgeable enough to really explain how it, this this works, but essentially you can you can take these three parameters: the the known input sequence, the relative intensities, and the mass to charge ratio. And and, and since you know what you uh, have put into the machine, you have a purified sample that you put in. You can you can use uh, those parameters to identify the species of each peak through in, in here. And certain residues. Uh, such as, let's see, tyrosine 18, how about this one? Uh, there, you, you, you see tyrosine 18 at both a mass of uh, 968 and 1017. 
And this mass to charge ratio is the difference that is exactly the size of a phosphate group. And so the authors were able to deduce that tyrosine 18 was phosphorylated in at least some of the protein that was, that was originally loaded into the mass spectrometer. Microdialysis is, is actually a surgical technique performed in vivo where this thin uh, cannula, the dialysis probe, is inserted into the brain to collect via diffusion molecules in the, inter, the uh, interstitial space of a living organism. So the dialysis probe is being constantly perfused um, and, and thus constantly collecting the contents of the extracellular space. So this technique is commonly commonly used to analyze small molecules like ions and, and, and drugs and neurotransmitters due to their ability to selectively get picked up across the semi-permeable membrane of the probe. And then the, the collected uh, um, dialysate can be temporarily separated or temporally separated. So perhaps the um, first few collection tubes are done before an experiment and then you conduct the experiment and then you have more test tubes after the experiment. So you literally have, uh, you know, 20 different dialysis tubes that were uh, collecting the from the inter, uh, interstitial space, and you can temporally uh, analyze what happened in, in that uh, interstitial space throughout the um, timeline of the experiment. So you can then analyze these uh, perfusates in, in various biochemical assays, you, I mean, you can do, you can really do anything. It, it's usually a biochemical assay because you're dealing with, um, you know, ions and um, another uh, small molecules. But a, a common high throughput uh, analysis might include HPLC or high pressure liquid chromatography, and it's basically used to separate the dialysate by size, and then um, is analyzed by usually by absorbance or uh, possibly even by mass spectrometry. So this is a very useful way of, of analyzing what's going on in the brain in a live animal uh, during experiments. Imagine that you have a heterogeneous suspension of, of different cells, but you only want a single cell type, for example. So perhaps, perhaps these cells are derived from a culture or maybe like primary cells taken from a liver. And you, you just want a single cell type from this complex mixture of cells. And, and this is commonly done by flow cytometry or simply called FACS or F-A-C-S for uh, fluorescence activated cell sorting. Uh, so our mixture of cells are first placed into the flow cytometer, which funnels them into a, a single file line. This is a process called hydrodynamic focusing. So this is where they're getting funneled into the line. This is the process of hydrodynamic focusing. And they're then, they're then dropped one by one, droplet by droplet, uh, through a, de a uh, detection laser. So the detection laser can, can analyze many different things. So beyond simply measuring uh, fluorescence at different wavelengths, it can also capture two fun uh, very fundamental parameters of cells called forward scatter light and side scatter light. The forward scatter light is a measure of the cell size. Um, larger cells scatter more light. And side scatter light is a measure of a cell's complexity. So these two parameters alone can actually be used to separate um, cells. Um, but for more precise control, antibodies or uh, endogenously expressed fluores uh, fluorescent transgenes um, are used to, to uh, separate proteins based on fluorescence. So in the case of antibodies, our our heterogeneous mixture of cells might first be incubated with a fluorescent antibody towards some kind of surface receptor. Uh, for example, if you wanted uh, HER2 positive cancer cells in a mixture of, of, of cells you extracted from the liver or something, you would add a fluorescent antibody towards HER2 and then collect cells expressing fluorescence because only uh, the HER2 overexpressing cancer cells would bind that fluorescent antibody. Other times, certain cells might express a fluorescent protein from a, a cell-specific promoter. For example, perhaps we might have an animal containing GFP under a macrophage-specific promoter, for example. 
when we subsequently collect primary cells from a liver tissue, our hepatocytes will drop right on through the flow cytometer because they're not uh, fluorescent. They don't express the GFP, but our fluorescent macrophages in the liver will get captured. Um, so this brings me to my, my last point is, is how are the fluorescent positive cells actually um, captured? Well, as they're dropped through, um, if fluorescence is detected, a, a very short and transient electromagnetic pulse charges that liquid droplet. So the electromagnetic currents can push the droplet and redirect it into a collection tube, a process called um, uh, electrostatic deflection. So the, deta the, the details are not too important as a researcher because all that matters is that your cells are getting separated. And, and you can do this either by cell size and complexity. Uh, you can do it by surface receptors if you have the antibodies to bind them or by endogenously expressed fluorescent transgenes. Plasmids are double-stranded DNA that <clears throat> can replicate on their own inside of a cell. Usually they are designed to replicate in E. coli because they're easier to work with. So the reason plasmids are so cool is because ex exogenous or outside DNA, something from like a PCR, for example, can be inserted into a plasmid and stably expressed in E. coli for future extraction if it's, if it's needed. And the plasmids can be designed to, uh, to carry different features like unique promoters, fusion tags, uh, selection markers, and many other things that can make your experiment much uh, easier to work through. In order, to, in order to insert a gene into a plasmid, you need a, a couple of key components in your plasmid backbone. First, the plasmid needs to contain two selection markers, meaning any cell or E. coli that have taken up this plasmid can then be selected for, such, by, such as by like adding an antibiotic. A common selection marker is ampicillin resistance gene, which renders the cell immune to the effects of ampicillin. So any E. coli cell that has successfully taken up the, uh, these plasmids will be immune to the antibiotic. So this is a, a positive selection marker because we are selecting cells that contain the gene. Now you also need a, a second negative selection marker that can tell you when your plasmid uh, successfully got into a cell, but doesn't contain your gene insert. And this is done with something like LAC-Z, an enzyme that produces blue substrate in the, in the presence of XGAL. So cells that produce blue substrate when cultured in XGAL should be avoided because if LAC-Z is functional, then we know our gene insert did not get spliced into the plasmid because the gene insert site is located within the LAC-Z gene itself. So the uh, restriction site where we want to be inserting our foreign DNA is, is going to be located on purpose inside of this LAC-Z gene. So if our plasmid fails to um, incorporate this foreign DNA, it'll simply recombine and go backwards. It'll go like this direction and re the lax C gene will be reformed and thus it'll be pl producing blue um, blue substrate in the presence of XGAL. And so that this would be an unsuccessful recombination. On the other hand, if the foreign DNA did successfully recombine, it would be interrupting the lax C gene. And it would be no longer respond to XGAL. And thus, if a cell is both antibiotic resistant, indicating a uh, successful plasmid recombination and no longer produces blue substrate indicating uh, gene insertion, uh, you can further analyze um, the, the species of the, of the plasmid. Apart from selection markers, which we'll discuss more, in more detail in a second, uh, the plasmid also needs some basic components for expression. And that means we will need things like a promoter, an origin of replication, um, so the DNA can replicate along with the host organism, um, a poly A tail if it's going in, into a, um, a, a eukaryotic cell. You also need a ribosome binding site and many other things. Okay, so how do you how do we actually get our gene into a plasmid? So the first step is to buy a plasmid backbone. Although you can make your own, it's honestly not even close to worth the effort. Um, you can probably find what you're looking for somewhere online. So you buy your plasmid backbone, 
that fits your specific needs. And then you also need to get some DNA to insert into it. And this is commonly done with a, a high fidelity PCR experiment that is capable of cloning large amounts of DNA, especially for larger genes that may be prone to error. So we don't wanna insert a gene that has a frame shift mutation. So we, want, so we need to use a polymerase in our PCR reaction that is not prone to error, that, that can replicate an entire gene without inserting uh, any, um, any point mutations. So once we have our, our amplified gene in our plasmid backbone, we, we treat both of them with a restriction enzyme, the same restriction enzyme, and it cleaves both our DNAs, uh, the plasmid in our, in our PCR gene, such that they will produce, it will produce a complementary sticky end for both of them. And that makes it so they can now be ligated together because they've been cleaved in the same way. Now this means that you need a gene that is flanked by restriction sites, because if it contains multiple, uh, uh, for example, internal restriction sites, your gene of interest will just get chopped up. And so uh, the restriction enzyme sequence that you use needs to be available in your plasmid as well. So when you choose your gene of interest to amplify by PCR, you need to be aware that it should be flanked by restriction enzymes uh, that are also present in your plasmid uh, so they can both be treated with the same restriction enzyme without uh, breaking apart your, your PCR gene, for example. Once you cleave both your gene of interest and your plasmid using the same restriction enzyme, they will now be compatible for ligation. And when incubated together, they will occasionally ligate together. Once you have these potentially rec re, uh, recombined plasmids, you, tran you transfect them into E. coli for selection. Um, e. coli that fail to be transfected, that fail to take up your plasmid, will be killed off by the antibiotic. And we can also screen for a successful gene insertion because the restriction sites used to insert our gene was located within the LAXZ gene. So if the LAXZ gene is not disrupted, then we will not uh, have successful gene insertion. In other words, bacterial colonies that are resistant to antibiotics and fail to produce blue substrate are, are suitable for uh, plucking out and expanding because they contain your plasmid. And then finally, just to confirm that your, your white antibiotic resistant E. coli strain does indeed contain your gene of interest, you do what's called a diagnostic restriction cleavage assay. This involves extracting the plasmids from the colony and, and cleaving the plasmids with the same restriction enzyme that you originally used, and then running that product through a gel. So if your gene was inserted, uh, the, the restriction enzyme cleavage should produce two bands, and one band should be exactly the size of your plasmid, and one should be exactly the size of your gene of interest. And you can simply sequence your plasmid if you have the technology or, or you know, just run it on a Western blot. Because what, we're, what we, we would be doing is we're simply kind of running the experiment backwards. Instead of we're cleaving it with the same uh, restriction enzyme. So we should have, we should see this fragment right here from your gene of interest. And we should see one fragment the size of your plasmid. And so by, and we should be able to, to see that size difference uh, in a, a, a gel electrophoresis chamber. Okay, so I think that was a lot to take in. And since this is such a critical technique, I'm gonna go through the typical workflow one by one. So the first thing you need to do is, is really plan out what you're going to do. And of course, you, you're always gonna plan, but for a plasmid cloning, it, it just takes uh, additional um, planning and making sure you're getting the right plasmids and you really plan your entire experiment because your choice of plasmid is going to uh, go with you for, for your entire um, experiment. So, so you amplify your gene of interest using a high fidelity polymerase that is, and, and you need to pick a gene or an area that is flanked by two restriction sites. And, and so you need to make sure that the, the two restriction sites that flank your amplicon are also in your plasmid because both will need to be cleaved in order to be compatible for ligation. And so you incub incubate your PCR gene product with the uh, restriction enzyme and then uh, purify it from a gel and make sure it's the correct size and it's in sufficient amounts and, and it's not, you know, 
fragmented or anything. Uh, then you incubate your cleaved DNA with your cleaved plasmid backbone that you bought from a commercial supplier. Then you add DNA ligase. Then uh, we're on step six now. You you take the product of that reaction and you transfect it. You transfect the plasmids into bacterial cells by heat shocking them or literally shocking them with electricity. So just to recall, transfecting means to move a plasmid into a bacterial cell um, in a in a in a way that you in, in without using a virus basically. And this causes them to take up the plasmids. And now we can begin uh, the selection process of, of E. coli colonies that um, that are not antibiotic resistant, and those ones are killed off. And then, um, you know, that indicates the plasmid did not get into the bacteria. And then colonies that produce blue substrate when cultured in, in, in GAL-X indicate that the LAC-Z gene remains functional and thus was not disrupted by gene insertion. And, and you know, they are ignored, basically. So the bacterial colonies that are expanded are white and antibiotic resistant. We take a few of these bacteria and we uh, we expand them out and then extract their plasmids. And we either sequence them or we do a diagnostic restriction enzyme test. And it would be possible to also do a, a southern blot where you have a fluorescent DNA probe complementary to your gene of interest. And you use that to make sure that your uh, plasmid is, is, or your gene of interest is in those new uh, recombined plasmids. So this is just a, a one kind of example workflow, but because um, plasmids are, are so varied and, and they come in so many different shapes and sizes and with so many different features, there's a lot of different ways to go about um, uh, cloning a gene of interest into a plasmid. But this is just kind of a, an example I think might be uh, easily applicable to, to a broader range of, of plasmid cloning techniques. So we just discussed how to insert a gene into an expression vector, but why would you do that in the first place? What is so cool about an expression vector? Well, first of all, you can get lots of DNA by expanding it through bacterial cultures, something you can't do with a PCR because a PCR can't faithfully replicate such large amounts of DNA, you know, the size of a plasmid. Uh, typically a PCR reaction, the, ap the amplicon is only 100 to 300 nucleotides and a plasmid is, is far larger than that. Uh, expression vectors also contain lots of accessory genes that can do some really wonderful things. For example, next to your gene of insert cloning site, so this is your cloning site, right? This is where your, your cDNA is actually gonna be inserted. You might find fusion tags, for example, such that your transgene, once it's expressed, will contain a C-terminal tag, such as a, a GST or a polyhistidine tag, which would allow you to easily purify your transgene by affinity chromatography. And this is because your, your cDNA, your gene of interest, will also, when the polymerase goes through and turns into a transcript, it'll also contain this, this fusion tag because the transcription terminator is downstream, so it'll, it'll contain all of this. Expression vectors also commonly contain reporter genes, such as GFP or RFP. And so you could, instead of a fusion tag or both, you could have a fusion tag and GFP over here before the transcriptional termination. That would allow you to easily visualize the subcellular location of your transgene. Or if you have a uh, fluorescence activated cell sorter, you could purify your cells expressing the transgene. Uh, the expression vector can also can, contain a myriad of different promoters. So on this side, uh, upstream of, of the cleavage site, you can, it can contain uh, promoters right next to the ribosomal binding site. So for example, you, if, if you insert your gene into an expression vector with an antioxidant responsive element, an ARE, then your transgene will only be expressed when free radicals are upregulated. Or if your, um, if your expression vector contains a clear element, a C-L-E-A-R element in your promoter, your transgene will only be expressed during starvation or periods of autophagy because autophagic proteins are driven by clear elements. Or if you simply want constitutive uh, expression, you can, use, you can do that with a CMV promoter. It's a viral promoter that drives high uh, basal expression. Uh, expression vectors also contain 
can, uh, can also potentially contain targeting sequences. For example, if you want your protein to be directed to the mitochondria, this, just to see what happens, uh, you can buy a plasma backbone containing a mitochondrial localization sequence. If you want your protein to be able to be conditionally deleted by Cre enzymes, you can get a plasmid where your gene insert is flanked by LOX-P sites. And we'll discuss that in a moment, but that's this is an incredibly useful technique that can allow you to conditionally delete genes by simply including these small uh, LOX-P sites that maybe flank your, your gene of interest. You could have LOX-P site here, LOX-P site here, and this will get deleted when you add the Cre enzyme. We'll discuss that a little more in a second. So the ability to pick and choose Oh, and also I want to mention uh, vial recognition sites, LTRs. So if you want your plasmid to be inserted into a virus, uh, you can you can add an LTR, a long terminal repeat into the plasmid backbone. And these are recognized by the integrase enzymes in a virus that allows it to be inserted into, um, into the host genome. And it also allows it to be packaged into a virus for transduction. So if you want to deliver your plasmid by virus, you can you can do that by adding viral, viral recognition sites. So the ability to pick and choose and order plasmids that can contain these different elements and, and give you all this customization allows some incredible genetic control and manipulation of your gene of interest and gives you and just makes your experiments uh, so much more robust and, and interesting. Site-directed mutagenesis is a technique used to insert point mutations or even deletions into specific genes. So this is done by first inserting your gene of interest into a plasmid as usual, or if possible to save time and money, simply ordering a plasmid that contains your gene of interest. Now, conventionally the plasmids that needed to be used had to be single-stranded plasmids because amplifying a plasmid via PCR, which is what you will need to do, is not as easy as genomic DNA because a plasma is generally too long as we discussed in the last slide. And it's also very stable and getting your primers in there to hybridize is much harder to do. However, newer techniques and um, special kits can actually do this just fine. So I'm gonna pretend like double strand DNA works. So another development that was critical for the ability to do site-directed mutagenesis in this way were polymerases that were accurate enough to replicate an entire plasmid. So generally, PCRs are not useful for transcripts longer than 300 or 400 base pairs. And a plasmid is the size of your gene plus a couple of these other genes like GFP or antibiotic resistance genes, LAC-Z, etc. So this simply makes plasmids too large to replicate via PCR. But we, what we have since discovered are these very high fidelity ways to replicate plasmids. And this allows us to insert point mutations during PCR and it's actually a pretty simple process. You, so you, what, you, what you need to do is you take your plasmid of interest and you develop primers that contain the critical error that you want to insert. So for example, if you want to insert a point mutation at the active site of an enzyme, you would develop a primer that covers the active site, but has a, a mismatch, has a point mutation. And then following amplification in PCR in these very high fidelity reactions, you will have a bunch of plasmids that contain a point mutation. And this plasmid can be used to make a knock an animal, uh, which we'll discuss in a, in a second, or the plasmid can simply be transfected or transduced in the cells. And we're gonna discuss that next. Transfection is simply the non-viral delivery of DNA or RNA into cells. And the, the most common method is lipofectamine. Although there are other methods that accomplish the same thing, I'm gonna discuss lipofectamine because I think it's the most common and I think it's also the easiest method. So lipofectamine is a cationic lipid that when incubated with your nucleic acid will form a liposome around it. And when this nucleic acid encased liposome is added to cells, it will be endocytosed into the cells and thus delivering uh, your gene in some cases at least, because you see it needs to escape from the endosomes called endosomal escape. And if you're transfecting DNA, it needs to get into the nucleus, which can be a rare event. 
Now, this is a relatively straightforward process, but a lot of the work comes in the form of planning and obtaining your starting material. So if you want to transfect DNA, you need to be, you need to be cognizant of the fact that DNA doesn't do anything until it reaches the nucleus. And additionally, it, it needs to contain all the necessary components for transcription and translation. So if you are transfecting your DNA for the purpose of protein expression, it needs to be a plasmid containing your gene of interest and in things like a promoter, a poly A tail, a ribosomal binding site, and everything else that's needed for expression. It also needs to get into the nucleus, like I said. So transfected DNA not only needs to escape from the endosome after entering a cell, but needs to find its way into the nucleus. And this process is generally promoted by inducing cell proliferation because during proliferation, the nuclear envelope breaks down. And during that time, the plasmids can drift into the where the nucleus would be. But in non-dividing cells like a neuron, transfection is very inefficient. Transfection of DNA is very inefficient. Only about 10% of neurons transfected with DNA expression vectors actually end up expressing the construct. And that's why neurons are commonly uh, transduced or transfected with mRNA for transient expression. So the more simple experiments can be designed around mRNA if all you want is transient expression. In this case, all you need to do is transcribe in vitro some cDNA of interest with an RNA polymerase, and then incubate the mRNA with lipofectamine, then add it to a cell culture. And that will essentially deliver tons of mRNA for expression. And your gene of interest will be upregulated in about 30 minutes, and it'll actually last for a couple of days depending on your transcript. If you instead want to knock down gene expression, you can generate short antisense oligonucleotides towards your gene of interest from the original cDNA transcript. And when, when that is transfected, it actually can knock down gene expression. And we'll discuss that in greater detail in the next uh, couple of slides. Transduction is the viral delivery of DNA or RNA into cells. So this process is much better at delivering RNA or DNA and is used for long-term expression, but it's also costly. It takes longer and requires a lot more planning. And, and it's also potentially dangerous because you're working with viruses. In order to transduce our plasmids, we need to first get them into the virus. So how do we get a plasmid that contains our gene into a virus? Basically, we, we begin with these packager cell cultures and three different plasmids. So one plasmid will contain our gene of interest and the plasmid backbone that we inserted it into. And importantly, that plasmid backbone will contain a viral recognition sequence, such as an LTR. Another plasmid will be the virus itself, which consists of the viral genome. And this includes the, most importantly, the integrase enzyme. This enzyme is the, is the enzyme that recognizes and binds the LTR and transports it to the nucleus and integrates it into the plasmid. And third, the, 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 uh, the third plasmid that will uh, be transfected with all these other ones will be the viral envelope protein that determines our virus's cell specificity. So basically we can design our third plasmid to recognize specific cell types if we want it to only transfect a very certain uh, type of cell, you know, such as a neuron. Okay, so we have these three plasmids our gene of interest inserted into a plasmid with LTRs, the virus itself containing integrase, and an envelope protein for the virus that directs cell specificity. Now we transfect all these plasmids into our packaging cells, and then they will begin making the virus and packaging our gene of interest. And after a couple of days, the, the supernatant of this culture will be rich with viruses containing our plasmid. We can then collect these viruses um, in the, from the supernatant, and then we can add these viruses to a second experimental cell culture, or even, uh, you know, uh, we could inject them straight into an animal. And the viral integrase will then, uh, the virus will then uh, latch onto these cells that will inject its DNA or RNA, and the, the integrase will integrate our plasmid of interest into the host cell's genome. And if all the necessary components for expression were found in our plasmid, we will have a protein expression vector or a plasmid expression vector with our protein of interest expressed. And this is an, it can also be confirmed by um, adding an antibiotic 
to our culture. And because our plasmids should probably also have contained an antibiotic resistance gene, any cells that were uh, successfully transduced uh, should be antibiotic uh, resistant. And so we're gonna discuss the um, typical transduction workflow in the next slide. Okay, let's go over the basic experimental pipeline of a transduction experiment. The first thing that you need are packaging cells. You could, you then need to, to plate them and you expand them to roughly 70% uh, confluency. So they're 70% uh, fully expanded out. Uh, you then transfect them with your lentiviral plasmids and your plasmid of interest containing the lentiviral recognition sites. And in some scenarios, you also get to provide the envelope plasmid if the lentiviral plasmid you have lacks the envelope protein. So it just kind of depends on the experiment. The, the lentiviral plasmid you use will be commercially purchased and your plasmid of interest will either be made yourself or ordered from a commercial library. You could do either one. There are actually tens of thousands of expression plasmids available online. They're collected in these huge libraries for, and, uh, from suppliers like AdGene. And you should always check first to see if someone has already made a construct that you could use. For example, if you wanted to transduce something simple like a GFP Huntington expression vector, just order it online. It'd be much easier than building yourself and, and, and making sure it works and doing all the experiments to confirm that it worked and everything. So always check to see if your plasmid is already available. So you incubate these plasmids in a transfection reagent like lipofectamine, and then add them to the packager cells. And after two or three days, you collect the supernatant, you centrifuge it, and then you collect the, the viral pellet at the very end, at the very bottom of it. You then transfer these viral particles to your experimental cells and successfully transfected cells should be antibiotic resistant, or uh, perhaps they express a fluorescent protein like GFP if it was included in your expression vector. Uh, you can also do a, a Western blot or a, a qPCR to confirm the presence uh, of your transgene. Okay, so we just finished our discussion of transfection, the non-viral delivery of nucleic acid and transduction the viral delivery of nucleic acid. So this slide is aimed at helping you decide when to use one over the other and their, their pros and their cons. So when you think of transfection, you should think of quick and easy expression or gene knockdown. Typically transfection is not used for stable expression because it doesn't get into the nucleus very well. Although if you want to avoid the use of viruses, it, it can still be done. The thing is the use of viruses is just so easy to get your cell into the nucleus for stable expression that it should just be done instead of a, a transfection. <clears throat> and transfection is easy because all you really need to do is <clears throat> enrich some mRNA and incubate it with lipofectamine. And if, if you can get this mRNA directly from cells by extracting their mRNA and turning your gene of interest into cDNA, then transcribing loads of mRNA you can you can make your your mRNA pretty easily, um, and so transfecting mRNA is a, is a pretty quick and easy way to force uh, another cell line to upregulate a gene. Alternatively, you can you can order the expression vector from adgene, and you can make mRNA in vitro from that. And if if this route is done, you can you can often find an expression vector for your gene of interest that also contains stuff like GFP or a fusion tag attached or uh, you know, other accessories that you might wanna uh, transfect into uh, your cells. That way you can, you can actually visually track your gene following transfection or even uh, purify it by affinity chromatography after transfection. So the cons of transfection are obviously, it, it doesn't last very long. The transfection technique itself, it induces cell stress and a researcher can't control how many plasmids make it into each cell. So if you're trans transducing mRNA, some cells get zero, some might get 10, probably not 10, but you don't know exactly how many um, plasmids are, get, are being transfected into each cell. 
And, and also I want to emphasize the cell stress. The um, transfection can cause considerable cell stress to, uh, depending on the type of cell. But neurons, for example, are known to uh, retract dendrites um, and I think even axons in response to transfection. So it's important to be cognizant of the damage that transfection itself can actually do. That's why you always need a control experiment. Uh, so transduction. So the number one reason to transduce your nucleic acid is because trans transduction gives you practically uh, permanent expression because the virus is taking your plasmid and is splicing it into the host cell's genome. So that's a huge benefit. There, I mean, there's only, uh, we, you can't necessarily get that with transfection nearly as easily. You're, you're, you're moving your DNA directly into the genome of your cells and it's very efficient. But it also has um, some pretty serious concerns. So um, kind of obviously genomic integration can disrupt important genes. So the virus um, can also cause inflammatory responses both inside the cell and between cells because you're putting a virus in the cells that's gonna affect the way they function uh, endogenously, and also overexpression from multiple transcripts, or or if you, um, or if your plasmin has a hyperactive promoter that drives high basal expression, this has been shown to uh, saturate the cell splicing and RNA export machinery and causes toxicity. So, not so the process of these viruses moving into the cell themselves is is cytotoxic, but the expression of the viral plasmin that contains your gene of interest, that alone, you know, even one or two years down the road, that is still cytotoxic. It can cause like lasting symptoms inside of the cell. So larger proteins, or sorry, the size of the plasmid you are splicing in is, is also limited by the packaging capacity of the virus you're using. So um, larger proteins are often just too big to fit into a viral caspid. So you need to be you need to uh, think about if your vi or if your protein or if your transcript is actually too big to even fit into a virus. So oftentimes it's it's often just too large and you have to resort to transfection. And that's why larger genes need to be transfected if you're going to try and uh, uh, it, get your gene into the the cell's genome. Um, another thing to be uh, to think about is that you're obviously working with infectious viruses if you're doing transduction. And so you need to be um, concerned about biosafety protocols and, and you know, various regulations. Um, and generally this requires just more preparation, more experience, and, and you, you have to be more careful when doing a transduction experiment. Viruses are really amazing because fundamentally what they are are these gene delivery homing missiles. They not only deliver our genes of interest, they, they can also be what's called pseudotyped, meaning they can be, they can, we can supply the envelope protein and that allows the researcher to control the viral uh, trophism or the cell type that it can infect. For example, if we wanted rabies, a virus that infects neurons to infect T cells, for example, we might pseudotype it with an envelope protein from HIV. But since we are interested in neurons, Let's not do that. Let's focus on this technique of tracing axons in synaptic contacts. Rabies is really useful for this technique because this virus infects neurons and travels retrogradely, so through dendrites, and then through the synapse to infect adjacent neurons, and then down the axons back to the cell body, and it repeats this process. Now, if you had a rabies virus containing fluorescent GFP, you can watch it travel from neuron to neuron and it, it's, it'll spread throughout the, the entire brain. That is useful, but researchers can manipulate the virus such that it only travels through a single synapse and then it stops. These RVDG viruses, which stands for rabies virus with deleted G protein, lack their envelope, envelope protein. So they are basically dead in the water without their envelope protein, unless this key, um, unless their, their, their host cell that they infect happens to express the G protein. So let me repeat that. This RVDG virus, let's see, RVDG, marked by this little triangle, 
this this RVDG virus lacks its envelope protein and it cannot spread unless unless the host cell it infects expresses that G protein. So what this RVDG system means is that if you genetically engineer a single population of neurons to express the G protein through something like a very specific promoter that you've been, that you've spliced in, the rabies virus will only be able to spread from that single population. But as soon as it leaves that that uh, starter population and enters a secondary population of non non transgenic neurons that lack the G protein, it will stop because uh, it, it doesn't have its envelope protein. It can't spread. So this this population of neurons that contain the G protein are called the starter population. You can see this starter population right here. So the big question is how how do we make a starter population within the brain? You you you, you could use a, a a very specific promoter, but that's uh, not as feasible to have a single promoter that drives uh, very population specific neuron expression. A, a better way is to use what's called a hel a helper virus that delivers the G protein. And it can also deliver a surface receptor called TVA. So TVA is a surface glycoprotein that allows us to pseudotype, pseudotype our rabies virus towards only neurons that get infected by our helper virus. So imagine, so it's kind of confusing, but imagine a micro injection of a helper virus that contains two things. It contains the G protein for the rabies virus and this surface glycoprotein called ENVA. ENVA is the uh, the receptor for the TVA um, ligand. So, so you 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 micro inject our RVDG virus that lacks the G protein and is pseudotyped with the e ENVA receptor, which is TVA. And then we can expect that only this starter population, which contains the ENVA receptor, will be infected. Furthermore, only these cells will produce functional rabies virus because they contain the G protein for our RVDG to form a functional virus. So inside these starter cells right here, um, they contain our, our fluorescently labeled rabies virus that will form with the G proteins and then travel retrogradely up, dendro uh, up dendrites, it'll cross the synapse, it'll infect the adjacent, adjacent neurons, it'll, then it'll travel back to the somas of the other neuron, but then it'll stop. So it'll, it'll, it'll travel up the dendrites, it'll cross one synapse, it'll travel up here uh, into these adjacent synaptic partners of our starter population, but then it'll stop because these cells that are in a different area of the brain do not contain the G protein. And without the G protein, they cannot make a functional virus for more spreading. So this technique is really pretty amazing because what it allows a researcher to do is to pick and choose a starter population. So you pick a starter population by micro injecting a small amount of, of our helper virus. Our helper virus is basically what jumps, is what makes a starter population because the helper virus tells our rabies virus what cells it can infect by the presence of this ENVA um, pseudo type um, um, receptor. And it also provides a G protein for uh, the uh, functional formation of our rabies virus. And so by monitoring the fluorescence of these, these uh, rabies viruses as they form, uh, you can, you can, you can you can see what other populations of neurons are making synaptic contacts with your starter population and since the rvdg virus only makes one synaptic uh jump before it essentially dies we can see monosynaptic connections because you can see as soon as this these functional viruses move through this synapse and then up into this neuron this neuron was not in, in contact with our helper virus micro injection so the uh, rabies viruses in this neuron are dead in the water. They will still be fluorescent because they contain, you know, a GFP. So this neuron will be fluorescent, but it won't move any further than here. So it allows us to track monosynaptic uh, connections to our starter population that is uh, dictated by the micro injection of our helper virus.
Another really cool technique that is kind of an offshoot of transduction and transfection is, is gene knockdown. So of course we can induce gene expression by transfecting mRNA or by trans transducing a gene for integration, but we can also knock down gene expression. And this is done by RNAi or RNA interference. And it typically involves the delivery of short 20 base pair RNA that is picked up by endogenous machinery of the cell and it's used to silence uh, complementary RNA. So if you transfect a 20 base pair sequence that is complementary to the, for example, the HER2 receptor mRNA, a protein called RISK, R-I-S-K, or C, will pick up the antisense RNA you transfected and start shutting down HER2 mRNA with it. So RNAi comes in three main forms. You can make duplex RNA, where one strand is antisense towards your gene to be silenced, while the other strand is the sequence of your gene of, inter uh, gene of interest. Um, they aren't perfectly complementary. Only 18 nucleotides will be complementary in these, in these duplexes, and there will be a two base pair overhang on each side. And, and that two base pair overhang is important for the recognition by the risk complex. And these can be made by PCR, or because it's such a short sequence, you can simply order them you can, you can tell a manufacturer what the sequence is that you want, and you need a sense and anti-sense transcript, and you can order them. So they're basically a primer dimer of your sequence of interest. And, and they can serve, I mean, they're, they're the size of primers. So instead of, you know, no one makes their own primers these days, they order them. So if you instead wanted to be silencing DNA, you order these two primers, essentially, and they form a dimer. And they can they can serve as a substrate for the risk complex if you um, transduce it into or uh, sorry transfect it into a cell. So in addition to this duplex RNA, you can use single stranded RNA that is antisense to your gene, and this actually requires chemical modification to stabilize it in a cell. This is because cells contain numerous exonucleases that degrade non-capped RNA because it looks like a virus. So your, your first thought when we, when we were talking about duplex RNA is that why not just put in single-stranded RNA? And the reason is because it's not stable, so it needs to be modified. The backbone is modified so it's extra stable and doesn't get broken down by uh, the cellular exonucleases. And, it, and if it's stable enough, it gets integrated into the risk complex and then it can go on to uh, efficiently target inhibition of whatever gene you design it towards. So you can also use um, a third mechanism called SHRNA or short hairpin RNA. And this is a type of, of unprocessed or immature silencing RNA that requires intranuclear transcription and processing before it's a functional duplex RNA for silencing. So given these characteristics, duplex RNA and SSRNA, single-stranded RNA, are delivered pretty much exclusively by transfection with something like lipofectamine, and it provides pretty efficient but transient gene knockdown. So although you can use PCR to make your, your duplex RNA yourself, it's much more difficult because a 20 base pair du uh, duplex RNA isn't complementary, uh, isn't completely complementary, and each end needs to contain a very specific two base pair overhang. So you're going to be ordering uh, these chemically synthesized um, from a commercial supplier. So in general, do, uh, transfecting duplex RNA is a pretty straightforward and simple process that you can you could do pretty easily in a lab. But if you're looking for persistent gene knockdown over the course of a cell's or an animal's lifetime, uh, you're going to need shRNA delivered directly into the genome by transduction. So many of the shRNA genes. Uh, for many different genes have already been identified and characterized. And if you wanted to use one, you would need to clone that endogenous shRNA transcript into an expression vector containing viral recognition sequences. Or an easier option would be to simply check suppliers and to see if your shRNA of interest has already been made and, and validated and, and, and stored in a library which it probably has because there are many shRNAs that have already been characterized and are already um, ready 
for mixing with a virus, basically. Because if it has been made, um, you can package it, package it into a virus and transduce it into your target cells in, in you know, a pretty easy, straightforward process that we discussed in the in the previous slide. And and also, I should note that shRNA needs to be transduced as opposed to transfected. You can't transfect shRNA because again, it's 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 shRNA is the unprocessed counterpart. It's the immature form. And all the processing machinery for shRNA is located in the nucleus. And because the processing machinery requires very specific motifs on the shRNA, uh, you need to make sure that the shRNA you use is validated and can actually function as uh, silencing RNA because it needs to get processed in the correct way and then um, be transported to the cytoplasm in the correct way. So shRNA is, is usually something that you order from an outside supplier from a validated source. In this slide, I want to go over the general outline of how a knock-in animal is made. And it's much harder than simply knocking out a gene because it's always easier to break something than it is to make something. So how does a researcher get a gene into all of an animal's cells? The first step is to make an expression vector, which involves PCR amplifying your gene of interest, inserting it into a vector by digesting both of them uh, with the same uh, restriction enzyme, uh, transfecting these plasmids into bacteria and selecting successful recombinations. Now, once we have our expression vector that is made, which is by itself a painful process, so we went over that previously. So again, it's recommended that you just order it if it's already been made somewhere. Um, but if you really want to customize your own uh, uh, expression vector, you know, you got to do that yourself. So uh, after you, you have your, your expression vector, you're going to want to insert that gene into an embryonic stem cell. So you begin by taking cells from the blastocyte of your animal. So let's pretend it's a mouse, right? So you take a pregnant mouse and you steal some embryonic stem cells from its blastocyte. You plate and expand out some of these cells, then you transfect them with your expression vector. And also you, you usually want to use a site-specific endonuclease. The reason you use a site-specific endonuclease, something like talons, is because it increases the chances of your gene getting spliced in at a very specific predetermined location. So integration of your expression vector without a site-specific endonuclease is not only kind of unlikely, but it, it, I mean, it still happens, but it's rare, but it can also happen in areas of the genome that are not even expressed. Uh, if your gene happens to integrate into an area of heterochromatin, it won't be expressed. And another, uh, another common method of gene targeting is to add in your expression vector uh, complementary sequences to the region of the genome you want your plasmid to integrate at. And then during homologous recombination, there is a chance that the endogenous chromosome will use your plasmid as a template for recombination. And this happens at uh, specific locations because your plasmid contained complementary sequences towards a specific region of the genome. So that's a, a mechanism of targeting your gene. So if you want to replace a, an endogenous gene with your expression vector, you would add complementary sequences towards the endogenous gene such that uh, chance homologous recombinations, uh, the machinery might use your plasmid to overwrite the endogenous gene. So if you are trying to overwrite a gene, you're going to want to use the complementary sequences method. But if you're just trying to get your gene into the genome, you'd probably want to use something like talons just for a site-specific um, integration. The problem with talons is that you can't design it very easily to a specific gene. And that's why it's not typically used to overwrite genes. So you typically don't transduce expression vectors because one, you can't control where it integrates and two, you can't control how many of them happen. You might get multiple copies and you're pretty limited by the size of your vector as well. If you're making a transgenic animal, you will probably want a larger insert because you're gonna have this animal forever. You want the best plasmid you can make. And you will be transfecting your plasmids most likely 
once you transfect your expression vector with a site-specific endonuclease, for example, you, you then select for embryonic stem cells. So only at st stage three right here. So you select for embryonic stem cells that successfully express your transgene by antibiotic resistance or fluorescence cell sorting. So if you if your plasmid contained GFP, you could just sell, sort the uh, cells that contain fluorescence, for example. You often do a lot of other things like a southern blot to make sure it's in the correct genomic location or a western blot to make sure your protein is being expressed correctly. And you know you, there's some other validation steps that you wanna do. You, you don't wanna um, continue with a a plasmid that was integrated in the wrong place or expressing the wrong thing or, you know, et cetera. So there's lots of validation steps that happen at this point. But once you're happy with the integration of your gene, you take your transgenic stem cells and you inject them back in to the blastocyte of a pregnant mouse. And that resulting animal that develops from that blastocyte will be chimeric, meaning every cell that developed from that initial micro-injected transgenic stem cell will be distinct from every wild type cell in that animal. Now, your animal is half and half at this point, right? It's, and the offspring of that transgenic animal might be full heterozygotic for your transgene. And that's what you're looking for, right? The, the, the first generation after micro injecting is a, is a, a chimeric animal. It's only half and half. So you're gonna wanna breed that chimeric animal for a, a couple more generations until you get a full heterozygotic um, transgene. So the process of making a knockin animal is actually, it takes at least two generations and it takes a while to make a transgenic animal because you know you have to wait for them to grow up, mature and mate and, and all that. So it takes you know at least a year. And, and, and yet you have to confirm which animals contain the gene. So you have to be taking samples from each animal and testing it to seeing which ones are full heterozygotic and so this is one of my favorite techniques because the Cree lock system allows researchers to delete genes in specific tissue and also at specific times so it's pretty easy to delete a gene with something like CRISPR these days and we'll, we'll discuss that in a second but it's way cooler to delete a gene in a specific tissue at specific times decided by you the researcher. So how is that done? Well, Cree is a recombinase that deletes genetic material that is flanked by LOX-P sites. So if Cree is active, it will scour the genome for LOX-P sites, and if it finds two of them in close proximity, it will delete the genetic material between them. So if you have sneakily placed your gene between two LOX-P sites, perhaps you used an expression vector backbone that contained two LOX-P sites that flanked the gene insert location, the cloning site, you can now delete your gene when Cree is expressed. So in other words, if your gene of interest is floxed, is what it is, means as two LOX-P sites flanking it, it will be, be deleted in any cell that expresses Cree. So if your Cree enzyme is under a tissue specific promoter, your gene will only be deleted in that tissue and for that reason, Cree enzymes under tissue specific promoters or even cell specific promoters are, are very hot commodities and, and they're very beneficial to research. And, and here are just some examples. Say you want to knock out your flocks gene in the liver. All you need to do is cross your animal with a mouse containing a Cree enzyme driven by the albumin promoter and you can buy the animal for, for you know $300 from Jackson Labs. If you wanna knock out your floxed gene in the brain, cross your animal with an, another animal that contains uh, Cree driven by the uh, CAMK2A promoter, uh, which is expressed only in the brain. If you wanted to knock out your flox gene in astrocytes, you could cross your animal with an animal containing Cree driven by the GFAP promoter. And there are hundreds of animals harboring different cell specific Cree enzymes. So if you manage to get your hands on an animal containing your gene of interest that is flanked by LOX P sites, you can knock out that gene in any tissue of the body by simply breeding it with a specific strain of mice. And you can always make your own transgenic animal containing a FLOX gene. If you want to knock out a unique gene, 
you, you it just simply requires that you insert your gene of interest into a vector that is flanked by LOX P sites. And, and then you, you can then make a knock-in animal by crossing it with another animal that contains the, the Cree under some kind of tissue specific promoter. And so this gives researchers incredible flexibility in deleting genes. And next we're gonna talk about how that's done in a inducible way by the researcher. In addition to simply having tissue specific Cree expression, you can also engineer the Cree promoter so that it can be turned on at will by the researcher and thus gene deletion can be flipped on like a switch. So you can manipulate the Cree promoter in such a way that it can be turned on by the small molecule doxycycline, which is what we see going on right here. So to do this, you need a second transgene in your Cree animal called the RTTA or a reverse tetracycline transactivator. The, the tetracycline activator protein transgene is also under a tissue specific promoter if you want it to be. So this transcription factor RTTA is, all, I mean, basically all it does, all this uh, tetracycline activator protein does is that it activates the TET-O uh, promoter after binding doxycycline or tetracycline. So this tra uh, transcription factor RTTA is inactive until it binds to the small doxycycline molecule. And if we subsequently have a Cree enzyme under the TET-O promoter, then it, it will be inactive until its transactivator, uh, our TTA, binds to doxycycline. So as long as you keep doxycycline away from your animal, your Cree will be inactive. So as a researcher, all you need to do is, is buy an animal with the RTTA transgene and a TETO driven Cree transgene, which is only about four hundred dollars. You can buy it from Jackson Labs, and then you and then you can cross that with your Floxed. Uh, you can you can cross that animal with your animal that contains the your gene of interest as Floxed, and you can then delete your gene at will by giving your animal doxycycline. And also, the the RTTA protein can be driven by tissue specific promoters, so you can have inducible. Cree deletion in tissue specific um, areas because you can see the RTTA is driven by tissue specific promoter. And again, it binds doxycycline, which allows it to bind the TETO promoter and drive Cree expression. And then Cree will then go find LOX P sites and delete them. So also note that this system isn't confined to inducible Cree expression for gene deletion. You can always substitute Cree right here. You can you can change this to another gene that you are interested in, and thereby develop tissue specific inducible expression for whatever gene you have behind the TETO promoter. So you could do that by knocking in uh, an expression vector with your gene of interest under the TETO promoter that was included in your original vector backbone. So remember how we talked about how vectors can contain whatever promoter you want it to. Well, if your vector you buy contains TET-O and you knock in your gene just downstream, if you clone your gene in, it could this could be Huntington. And then if you mate that with an, an animal containing the RTTA uh, transactivator, you can you you now have tissue specific expression, or uh, not tissue specific, but well, you could be tissue specific expression, but it's also doxycycline dependent. So you 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 can um, you can have incredible flexibility with the ability to express. Uh, genes and as well as delete genes. Another fascinating inducible Cree system is based on this discovery that cytosolic estrogen receptors undergo nuclear translocation after binding to estrogen. And researchers discovered that by fusing Cree to the estrogen receptor, that Cree could then be induced to translocate into the nucleus and digest LOX P sites following estrogen administration. So they expanded on this technique by engineering the estrogen receptor such that it no longer responded to endogenous estrogen and instead would only respond to tamoxifen, which is the, it kind of looks like estrogen, but it's not quite, it's different. So the, the Cree 
fused to the mutant estrogen receptor wouldn't translocate in response to endogenous levels of estrogen, but would rather only translocate in response to a researcher administering uh, tamoxifen. And by fusing this mutant estrogen receptor with Cree and placing it under a tissue-specific promoter, we have effectively made a tissue-specific Cree expression system that responds to tamoxifen. Just to hammer home how useful this system is, I made this slide with a couple of examples right off the top of my head. So I won't read them to you, but you can essentially, you know, you can buy two animals, one with a flox gene you are interested in, and, and one that contains a tissue specific inducible Cree, and you can study the result of what happens when you when they, they breed together. And that alone can provide the impetus for an experiment because there are basically an infinite number of experiments you could do with this, this, this basic setup. And, and there are some important considerations, um, however, when, when, you, when you try and do one of these experiments. Uh, first and foremost, not all the cells you would expect to, to have deleted your gene will actually delete your gene. And this is simply because Cree is not 100% effective. Things, um, things at the molecular level can be unpredictable and you should only expect about 80 to 90% of your target cells to successfully, successfully delete your flux gene. Uh, second, Cree can sometimes delete off target sequences and cause DNA damage. So having an inducible Cree is, is extra important because if it's uh, constitutively expressed, it can actually damage the host cell's DNA and it, it, it can lead to you know, cytotoxicity. So however, the, the systems like Cree ER receptor and even the TET O Cree can, can also sometimes leak and it can sometimes delete your LOX P gene when it's not supposed to. And um, also finally, an important consideration is that these tissue specific Cree enzymes don't have to be used for gene deletion. In fact, they, they often contain reporters like GFP, meaning that tissue specific Cree mice can be used to simply monitor certain cell types. For example, if you buy a mouse with GF, uh, GFP Cree driven by a VGLUT1 or VGLUT2 promoter, you can effectively visualize glutamate neurons in the mouse's brain. And that alone might be you know, worth purchasing the, the GFP Cree mouse if, if, if that's what you happen to be researching. Talons and ZFN are endonucleases that are guided by amino acid to DNA interactions. And when they bind to a complementary sequence, they cleave the DNA. The fact that talons and Z ZFN are guided by amino acids makes these two endonucleases distinctly different from CRISPR. That is the main difference. And it means that in order to design or target uh, these enzymes to unique, unique areas of the genome, a new amino acid sequence needs to be carefully developed and tested, and that's not not easy to do. The, the new amino acid sequence needs, needs to fit snugly into the major groove of DNA and contain just the right pattern of hydrogen bonding in order to faithfully and consistently cleave that same area of the genome. However, talons and ZFN are still very useful today. Talons, which is actually a, a FOK1 or FOK1, FOC1 endonuclease fused to a DNA binding domain called TAIL is actually used for safely integrating transfected uh, DNA. So I mentioned this briefly earlier, but uh, just because talons can't be retargeted very easily doesn't mean the currently used already targeted talons are not useful. They are actually very useful. For example, the AAVS1 talons is, is down here. Uh, is, is very accurate and very specific for a region of the genome that is already known to be a great area to insert a plasmid. These are called safe harbors because not only is the AAVS1 region a non-important gene, but it affords stable expression for whatever gene you want to insert into that region. So if you're knocking in a gene, you would actually prefer to use a, a safe harbor endonuclease like talons instead of something like CRISPR which actually produces more off-target cleavages 
and is not 100% specific for its target area. Thus, by transfecting your plasmid construct plus mRNA for an AAVS1 talons, you can expect that successful integration will likely be predictably located at this single genomic region. And you can then confirm integration with a PCR followed by a southern blot to see if, um, you know, if the size changes based on the integration of your gene. That's how you confirm that um, something like an AAVS1 uh, tail uh, talons uh, integrated your gene into the correct location. So, of course, I need to talk about CRISPR. Everyone is excited about it, and, and, and so am I. And, and so what is so cool about this technology is that it is a site-specific uh, site endonuclease that is guided by RNA. And since we can make RNA no problem, we can direct cleavage to any site in the genome. So you can target almost anything in the genome by just making some new gRNAs um, for it to target. And gRNA is only about 25 nucleotides long. And when it's incubated with Cas9, the endonuclease, the gRNA gets loaded into the Cas9 enzyme, and it then begins combing through the genome for a PAM sequence, a PAM sequence. You can see that just upstream of our target, this, this would be our gRNA, and you can see there's a scaffold which fits into the Cas9 uh, protein, then a spacer, the spacer is what is actually gonna be looking for its target sequence. And when it finds a PAM sequence, it then tests for homology of the spacer sequence with the target sequence. And if there is homology, you have target cleavage. Uh, so these PAM sequences are the only limitation in terms of gRNA targeting. So these PAM sequences are actually very short. They're only about three to six nucleotides long. And so it's not actually that big of a deal that you're confined by them. But the gRNA you construct needs to be immediately upstream of a PAM sequence. And that is because Cas9 will scan the DNA for actually PAM sequences. It won't scan for your, your, uh, your spacer sequence, but it'll look for PAM sequences. And, and only at these PAM sequences will the Cas9 enzyme decide to open up the DNA and actually test for homology with its uh, gRNA that it contains. If the gRNA anneals after opening up the DNA at a PAM sequence, then the endonuclease will be triggered and the DNA gets cleaved. And the cleavage commonly results in uh, insertions, deletions, and frame shift mutations because uh, the repair process, uh, non-homologous injoining, is is very imperfect process. So this all sounds pretty amazing, right? Because it means that if you have some cells that express Cas9, perhaps as a trans gene, which is available for many, from many different suppliers, all you need to do is transfect some gRNA towards a target area that is next to a PAM sequence. And most of the time it is cleaved and the faulty repair mechanisms result in a frame shift mutation. So you can also order entire whole animals that express Cas9 in every cell and you can you could transduce, perhaps with a virus, your gRNA and potentially be able to delete any gene you want in the organism by simply packaging some gRNA into a virus and injecting it into the animal. It's really just an amazing technique with so many different implications. Um, but there are some, some big issues facing CRISPR right now that are kind of preventing it from getting into the clinic. So the first one is off-target cleavage. Uh, CRISPR appears to have a, a pretty big problem of overactivity in that some Cas9 homologs that have short PAM sequences are cleaving much too often. So there was one study that I read that found upwards of 20,000 off-target cleavage events that, uh, that were not complementary to the gRNA. So to, to fix this, either the PAM sequence is elongated such that it's a seven or eight base pair PAM sequence uh, which, although it limits the area of the genome you can effectively target, it also limits off-target cleavage. You can also make sure your gRNA is very specific to your area, because the more off-target sequences that share um, uh, similarity with your gRNA, the more likely they are to be cleaved. So um, design your gRNA that is 
very specific to your gene of interest. And also when designing your gRNA, it's common to design gRNA towards three different locations uh, towards your gene of, that you wanna knock out. Because oftentimes for reasons people don't understand, some reasons are just easier to cleave than others. And uh, it may be due to the presence of histones and heterochromatin, but um, regardless, typically three different gRNAs towards different parts of, you, of your gene are tested for their ability to cleave your gene. And this is done before the actual experiment, just to make sure you have um, a, a high fidelity gRNA that effectively uh, promotes uh, your gene cleavage. And you want the one that performs the best for subsequent experiments. Okay, so now that we understand how CRISPR works, let's talk about some of the more advanced method or applications of this system. First, like the inducible Cree systems we had, we can also make inducible CRISPR systems using the same principle. So if we have some cells or even a whole animal that expresses Cas9 under an inducible TRE or TET responsive element, we can essentially trigger Cas9 expression at will by supplying the animal with doxycycline. You can see that right here. When you supply the animal with doxycycline, uh, it will bind the reverse tetracycline transactivator protein expressed from some other, some you know, a second trans gene, and it, it will activate the expression of the gene downstream of TRE. In this case, it's Cas9. So we can induce Cas9 expression with doxycycline, and then simultaneously uh, supply our cells with uh, transfected gRNA of choice, and we can trigger gene deletion. And so this system is, is better than uh, constitutive Cas9 expression because Cas9, being an endonuclease, can sometimes cause nonspecific DNA cleavage without gRNA, or even perhaps it, you know, it could pick up random endogenous RNA and use it as GNA, gRNA. And indeed, basal Cas9 expression is actually pretty cytotoxic. So by controlling the expression of Cas9, we can avoid these, these possible confounding variables and you can delete basically any gene you want just by transfecting some uh, gRNA that is downstream of a PAM sequence and by supplying doxycycline. So if you think about what CRISPR actually is, you will realize that it's more than just a site-specific endonuclease for cleaving DNA. CRISPR is basically a homing missile you can direct to any part of the genome. So if we can direct this Cas9 protein to any region of the genome, think of what else we could do. Well, first of all, we, if we don't want to be destroying a gene, we can simply inactivate the enzymatic activity of Cas9, forming DCAS9, called dead or deactivated Cas9. And with this DCAS9, we can do some really cool things like fusing it, fusing it to a universal and strong transcriptional activator like VP64. And by doing this and attaching a gRNA towards a gene of interest, we can actually induce gene expression or in gene transcription at that uh, target locus. We could also deactivate gene expression by attaching an H3K9 methylase to DCAS9 and direct silencing histone methylation. We can also, perhaps this sound par sounds paradoxical, we can attach an endonuclease to our deactivated Cas9. And by using an endonuclease that requires dimerization, like FOC1, we can actually greatly reduce the probability of off-target cleavages. Because you can target it to two different areas of the genome. And when these uh, two Cas9 molecules come together, it also brings together FOC1, which dimerizes, so it's kind of like coincidence detection. And then they, you know, it cleaves the DNA at the very specific spot. Another way to help reduce off-target cleavage with new better Cas9 proteins is to genetically engineer them so they require longer PAM sequences for activation. So I mentioned this in the last slide. So although a longer PAM sequence limits your selection of cleavage areas, it also increases specificity. So there is definitely value to doing that. A third popular strategy to reduce off-target cleavage is to turn Cas9 into a nickase, where it only cleaves one strand of the DNA. And by adding 
two different species of gRNA that are separated by only a couple of nucleotides, you can get double-stranded DNA cleavage at your region of interest. So this is kind of like the FOC1 where you, you, um, you target the gRNA to slightly different areas, target B, target A, and since your uh, CRISPR is only nicking the target area, if it nicks right next to each other, this will form a double-stranded break because they just happen to be right next to each other. So this is another kind of coincidence detection where in order for a double-stranded uh, double stranded cleavage event to happen, you need both these uh, NIC aces to be directed to nearly the same location. Otherwise, NICs elsewhere in the genome are actually very easily repaired. A NIC is, is you know, that's very easy to repair, high fidelity. So only these NICs that happen in close proximity uh, will actually produce, produce a double-stranded break. Bisulfite treatment is a is a technique that is used to analyze DNA methylation, which remember is distinctly different than histone methylation. I always have to point that out. So histone methylation can be activating or inhibitory based on its position, but DNA methylation is almost always inhibitory, inhibitory to gene expression. And to map cytosines within DNA that are methylated, we treat the DNA with bisulfite. This treatment largely replaced the older method of assaying DNA methylation, which was done through uh, methylation dependent primers that would only amplify the genomic sequence if it was methylated. Uh, this new bisulfite treatment is considered a high throughput method because you can map methylation sites across the entire genome. And so, so to begin, you, you simply extract your genomic DNA and you treat it with this bisulfite chemical. Uh, that chemically converts non-methylated cytosines in your DNA into uracil. So this cytosine, for example, is non-methylated. You treat it with bisulfite, it turns into uh, uridine. And then when you PCR amplify this, you will now have a T where you should have a C. So if it means that if this was a non-methylated base, uh, you will now have a T. If it's a methylated base, it will re remain a C. So when you sequence your DNA, you, you can deduce where um, where a, a, a base with, was methylated or not based on whether you have a T where a C is or it remains a C because the methylation group actually protects the cytosine from the, the process of deanimation, which is what bisulfite actually does. Now, the, the big problem with this treatment or this technique is that bisulfite treatment actually uh, degrades DNA. And so your DNA needs to be treated with as little bisulfite as possible. So as short amount of time as, as you can to deanimate your cytosines. So once you have your treated DNA, you, you PCR the product and the uridines will be converted to T because the polymerase will place an adenine across from your uridine. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of confusing, but so like, the, the basic idea is that you PCR amplify your sequence of interest or even the entire genome, and you can sequence your DNA. And if you have a TA mismatch where you should have, should have a CG, you can deduce that the sequence was originally non-methylated. And so you can do this for the entire genome and you can map the, uh, the peaks of where you see uh, changes such as this. And, and you can look at promoters across the entire genome. So CHIP-seq uh, stands for chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing. And it's basically just an immunoprecipitation of chromatin followed by DNA sequencing of whatever DNA is associated with the chromatin. So you begin by taking out cells or tissue of interest and fixing it in formaldehyde. So this formaldehyde fixative is cro cross-linking all of your proteins, most importantly, is cross-linking proteins and histones to our DNA. So we might then purify this protein DNA chromatin by centrifugation. And then with this chromatin DNA mixture, we fragment it into smaller, more manageable pieces, roughly 200 to 300 base pairs in size. And this is done usually by sonification or by a very light treatment of using restriction enzymes. Then afterwards, the, the DNA 
protein complex is run through a gel to make sure it's the uh, correct size because the fragments that are too large or, or small are not precipitated or sequenced very well. So you have to make sure you, you have the right size uh, of, of protein uh, DNA length. So if everything looks good, then we can begin the precipitation experiment that uh, actually very clo uh, closely resembles a regular amino precipitation like we discussed earlier. That is, you would begin by conjugating your primary antibody to beads through uh, protein G or protein A. And there are other ways to conjugate your primary antibody to a bead. But just remember that the most important part of the chip seek is the primary antibody you choose to use when pulling down your chromatin. Because only the protein recognized by this antigen will remain. And only DNA associated with this protein will be sequenced. And so that's why when you see a paper that does chip seek, the first thing you should wonder is, is what protein did they target during the precipitation? That's the primary variable in a chip sequencing experiment is, is the antibody that you use to pull down DNA. Anyways, once you, once you have your antibody conjugated to beads, you incubate them with your chromatin mixture. You mix them together for an hour or two, and then you discard the supernatant you wash it a few times, make sure you get all the excess stuff out that's unbound. And then you elute the remaining protein DNA complexes. Uh, you then degrade all of the protein that remains, which will be mostly your protein of interest plus any associated protein. But the protein isn't what we're interested in here. We're, we're interested uh, in discovering the DNA that was bound to your protein of interest. And that's why you degrade your protein with proteinase K then the remaining DNA is sequenced and it's mapped to the reference genome and, and peaks or the number of reads you get back in, indicates that the uh, interaction between your protein and that specific region of the genome. And a read will typically um, look something like this. This is a chip seek through uh, for H3K4 ME3 methylations. So a a histone methylation, you can see histone methylations are peaking in certain areas of the genome. And you can you can correlate this with uh, particular areas of a reference genome. PAR-CLIP stands for photoactivated ribonucleoside enhanced cross-linking. And so we are using photoactivated ribonucleosides to enhance cross-linking. Uh, the, te the technique is a lot like is a lot easier than it sounds, and it's all like chip seek, but it's aimed at identifying and sequencing RNA protein interactions instead of DNA protein interactions. The reason you, you need to use this fancy technique instead of simply co-immunoprecipitating RNA from protein um, is that protein RNA interactions are less stable than DNA protein interactions, and so even with formaldehyde, if we try and pull down RNA with protein antibodies, RNA is generally lost. So in order to stabilize the interaction between RNA and protein, we incubate our live cells with special uridine nucleoside, or nucleotides. That is this 4SU right here. The, uh, these nucleotides, when incorporated into new RNA strands, will be capable of forming a covalent crosslink with proteins when exposed to high energy UV light. And we see that here. This high energy UV light causes the cross-linking of the RNA strands with any DNA that is immediately nearby. So we culture these cells in this special photoactivatable uridine for a day or two, and then photoactivate and induce strong covalent cross-linking between the RNA and any associated protein. You can then extract all of the RNA protein complexes, degrade uh, contaminating DNA with DNAs, and then pull down specific proteins of interest, um, like a chip seek. So you could, for example, you could pull down risk using an antibody towards risk conjugated to beads, and what kinds of microRNA, and then you could identify what kinds of microRNA were loaded into the silencing machinery at the time of UV activation. And so you could do that, of course, by sequencing the associated RNA that is pulled down by an antibody towards risk. So again, we're, we're 
adding this photo activated photo activatable uridine to the cell culture that allows us it to crosslink with any associated protein when we activate it with UV light. And then we can immunoprecipitate uh, certain proteins using uh, you know basic immunoprecipitation. So we could pull down risk, for example. Then if we pull down risk, we're also gonna pull down all the microRNA that is associated with it. So we could treat it with protease, uh, cDNA, library preparation, then you could you could sequence it, then map it to the genome, and then you could see the species of microRNA that are present in the cell at the time of UV crosslinking. And so this is a, a very powerful um, technique. Chromosome confirmation capture is a really cool high throughput technique that is used to identify chromosome structure, like loops and interactions between genomic locations that are far apart in terms of their primary sequence, but are perhaps in close proximity in terms of their three-dimensional location in the nucleus. You could, for example, uh, identify an enhancer on chromosome four that could be promoting the expression of a gene on chromosome eight, something you could never infer from primary sequence alone. So to do this, you, you begin by cross-linking all of the chromatin DNA into stable structures and their native conformations. And then you extract them and you purify them by centrifugation. You then actually use a restriction enzyme to fragment the DNA and then a ligase to ligate the DNA back together. The frequency of ligation between any two segments of DNA uh, is, serves as kind of a proxy for how closely they are located in three-dimensional space. So just to go over that again, so we basically have uh, this confirmation that's been preserved by something like formaldehyde or a fixative. And we separate, separate it out, we, and we get it all together, and then we cleave the DNA. And then we re-ligate it. And based on proximity, proximity ligation, if two pieces of DNA frequently ligate together, even if they're from completely different regions of the genome, uh, they will, if, if they frequently re-ligate back together, it indicates they're in close proximity in the actual nucleus in their native conformation. So, so imagine like a bundle of wires, right? And you randomly cut all the loops and then you randomly sew them back together with the their closest neighbor. Wires that are more prone to being sewn together, even if they're from completely different appliances, are said to be in close proximity because they are commonly not ligated back together. So by the same token, if, if following restriction, enzyme cleavage and ligation, you commonly see a, a region from chromosome, chromosome five ligating to say a region from chromosome 13, you can deduce that these two DNA segments must be near each other in three dimensional space. So we just finished some pretty fancy ways to screen for DNA and RNA interactions with protein, but there's actually a way more simple way of doing it. Although it's not high throughput like chip or par clip, it can be used to validate potential interactions of interest. So a gel mo mo mobility shift assay, as it sounds, simply involves incubating your protein of interest with a genetic sequence you suspect it interacts with. And, and then testing to see if that treatment alters its ability to migrate through a gel. So if incubation with a certain protein slows or shifts the mobility of a DNA fragment, then it's very likely that the, addition, the additional size due to the protein is slowing the DNA's migration through the gel. So a gel mobility shift assay is often done as a follow-up to something like a ChIP-seq because say, uh, for example, say you, you do a, a ChIP sequencing excuse me, you do a chip sequencing using an antibody towards Huntington and the promoter from JNK is enriched in the sequencing reads. Well, to confirm this potential interaction, it would be smart to incubate Huntington, the incubate the Huntington protein with the JNK promoter generated by PCR. And then to see if Huntington's presence shifts the mobility of JNK's promoter in a gel. If it does, then there's probably an interaction between the two, although it doesn't take into account, you know, histones or whatever else is in, in, in the 
in vivo cell, it does show an interaction between the, the basic DNA fragment and the protein. A, a microarray is one of the most well-known and popular techniques for measuring gene expression. And it can loosely be described as a reverse northern blot. So if you remember, a northern blot involved immobilizing RNA from your cell lysate and probing it with fluorescent oligonucleotides towards your gene of interest. Well, a microarray is essentially the reverse, where your probes are immobilized on a chip and you fluor fluor fluorescently label RNA from your cell lysate and use them as probes on your chip. So these microarray chips contain thousands of spots called features, and each feature contains hundreds of chemically synthesized oligonucleotides towards a specific gene of interest. So let me repeat that. These, these microarray chips contain um, thousands of spots, they're called features, and each feature contains hundreds or even thousands of chemically synthesized oligonucleotides towards a specific gene of interest. So for example, a, a, you know, a, a feature number 751 could contain various oligonucleotides that are complementary to the uh, MYC or the, the MYC gene, or, or feature 3028 might contain various sequences complementary to the myosin gene. And, you know, at least in my mind, this is actually the most amazing part is that oligonucleotide synthesis has become so streamlined that these chips can contain thousands of spots that each contain antisense oligonucleotides for specific genes. And so, and so once you buy a chip that contains the right features, the right antisense oligonucleotides to study the genes you are interested in, you need to then add all of the probes. And the probes are actually derived from your cell lysate itself. So you take a bunch of cell lysate from two different groups. Say you have a control group and an experimental group, and you extract all the mRNA from the sample. And then you reverse transcribe all of the mRNA in the sample using fluorescently labeled nucleotides. So in one group, you synthesize the labeled cDNA using a green fluorescent dye. So you'd be doing that over here. You make all of the mRNA from your control sample green. And then the, in the other group, you synthesize cDNA using a red fluorescent dye. So you now have this fluorescent goo mixture of, CD, of cDNA from your cell lysate. And I call it a goo mixture because it's, it's just all of your mRNA that's now fluorescent. It's not actually, you can't actually see it's fluorescent, but it's now, it's, it's mRNA that's now fluorescent and it's, it's essentially looking for its complementary sequence to hybridize to. So you have one goo mixture is red, one goo mixture is green. And of course you can't, you can't literally see it, but once you incubate the cDNA with the chip and then image it, you will be able to see the fluorescence. And so that's what you do is you, you add your fluorescent mRNA mixture to your microarray and allow your probes to hybridize. So you, you take your goo mixtures, you add it to the, the plate, and then you let it hybridize, then you, you vigorously wash off all the excess. And then you image the fluorescence left on the chip at uh, both wavelengths, at red and at green. So you do two scans at each wavelength, corresponding to both samples. And then you feed that information into a computer to quantify relative expression. For example, if, if spot number 5778, which corresponds to, let's say, the Huntington gene, because it contained oligonucleotides antisense to Huntington. If that spot turns out to be red, for example, that means your experimental sample had more Huntington mRNA relative to your control sample, because the red, which indicates mRNA from the experimental sample, would drown out the green from your control sample. And so note the word relative, that, that's key here because you can never compare results from two different microarray experiments because you, you're just comparing this control sample to this experimental sample. And it depends on so many different variables that you can't compare uh, 
microarrays from different experiments only within this one experiment. So, so just to summarize, because this is kind of a difficult subject, difficult, difficult concept, um, you buy a chip. So this is the chip that contains thousands of spots and each spot contains oligonucleotides antisense to a specific gene. You then take mRNA from a control and, and mRNA from an experimental sample and reverse transcribe them into cDNA using fluorescent nucleotides. You then add the fluorescent goo to a microarray. You incubate it for, for hours. You wash it and you dry it. Then you image the resulting fluorescence at each spot. And then you get an idea of relative expression for each gene that was on the microarray. For example, this little red spot right here, it could correspond to any genome. I don't know what, but I can tell you that based on this diagram, that would mean the experimental sample had higher expression because it's red. So you'd have to look up in the manual what that feature corresponds to. And it is upregulated in the experimental sample. So the first step in beginning a microarray experiment is to find a microarray chip that contains the genes and the pathways that you are interested in. And that takes some shopping because although not so much anymore, because I believe microarrays have gotten uh, so much better that they actually can contain every gene on a single chip, which by itself is mind blowing. Although I'm not completely sure exactly how many genes it contains, but uh, so, for example, you wouldn't you wouldn't want a microarray developed for melanoma cancer gene analysis if you're going to look at a brain disorder. So you need to make sure your microarray contains the right features. Um, and if you're interested in in micro RNA, then you don't want a microarray designed for mRNA expression, for example. So going into the experiment, you need you also need two or more groups to study because ultimately the data you will be left with is just a boring fluorescence value at each feature. And so in the end, you will be doing a pairwise comparison between two groups in order to determine relative expression. So to begin, you will be, um, you will extract total mRNA or sometimes all RNA if your chip contains, you know, non-coding or micro RNA. And then before going any further, you want to check its quality by the uh, spectrophotometry or gel electrophoresis. And if your RNA looks good, you reverse transcribe your RNA into cDNA using either random primers, or if you're dealing with total RNA, you use poly DT primers. The first step in beginning a microarray experiment is to find a microarray chip that contains the genes and the pathways that you are interested in. And that takes some shopping because um, if you're looking, if you want to look at microarray or uh, sorry, micro RNA or long non-coding RNA, you have to make sure it's found on the chip that you're interested in. And you know, if you're if you're you don't want to you you don't want to to buy a microarray for melanoma cancer gene analysis if you're looking at a brain disorder. Um, although I, I'm not sure exactly how, if that's if that's still the case because I think microarrays have gotten so high throughput that they might actually contain every single gene in you know the mouse's genome, for example, which by itself is mind blowing. So I think that actually might be the case, but maybe I don't know how important it is, but um, either way, um, something to keep in mind. So before going into the experiment, you will need two or more groups to study because ultimately the data you're going to be left with is just a fluorescence value for each feature. And so in the end, you will be doing a pairwise comparison between two groups in order to determine relative expression. So to begin, you will be extracting total mRNA or sometimes all RNA if your chip contains long non-coding or uh, micro RNA. 
And then before going any further, you want to check its quality by either a, a spectrophotometry or a gel electrophoresis. You want to make sure that your, your RNA is, is ready to, to put through the microarray. And so if your RNA looks good, you reverse transcribe your RNA into cDNA using either random primers if you're dealing with total RNA or poly DT primers if you're working with um, mRNA. The, the nucleotides you might use could be, um, a, a popular one is amino allyl DUTPs, which contain those reactive amino groups along the backbone of the nucleotides, so the backbone of the cDNA. And then you can easily react and conjugate those um, uh, reactive amino groups with a fluorescent dye like Psi5. So you label both groups with a different dye. So, so their contribution to the resulting fluorescence can be measured. So your control group and your exper experimental group need to be measured with different dyes. So you know where the expression is, is coming from. Then the mixture of labeled cDNA, including both your control and your experimental group is added to the microarray and incubated overnight in an oven. And the next day the chip is, is thoroughly washed, it's dried, and then it's imaged in a microarray scanner. And it, then a computer goes through each feature and it you know kind of consults the, the microarray manual to see what each feature uh, corresponds to because you know you can't tell what each feature is for example feature 571 could be some you know random gene you, need, you don't know what that is just by looking at it so the computer integrates all this information and it feeds back to you um, uh, some pretty results and much of values and you can compare uh, control to experimental groups an alternative to microarray based analysis of gene expression involves simply sequencing your nucleic acid. So like a microarray experiment, you extract whole mRNA, you remove the DNA impurities, and you check its quality at 260, 280 absorbance. Um, the RNA is fragmented into smaller, shorter, manageable segments of around 200 nucleotides, and then it's reverse transcribed into cDNA. Um, at this point, your cDNA is actually usually shipped off to an outside lab to sequence each sample uh, of cDNA because a high throughput sequencer machine costs about a million dollars and not very many people have it. So you usually pay an outside lab to receive your cDNA and sequence it. And what you get back are millions of reads. Reads are these short 100 to 200 base pair sequences that can be mapped to a reference genome such as you know, gene A might have this many reads, gene B might have this many reads. And the number of reads indicates the uh, number of mRNA that was detected in the sample. And so to be honest, the experimental part of, of this technique is, is pretty easy and straightforward. I think the, the more difficult part is the, is the bioinformatics and analyzing all of the data that you get, because you get a ton of data and it can be used for a lot of different things. And so uh, it typically involves using R and going through um, a couple programs. You, you, you wanna, there's lots of different controls and um, uh, normalizing that needs to be done, um, which I'm not completely sure about how it all works, so I'm not gonna go through it, but this is the general idea of how the, uh, the, the uh, wet bench part of the experiment goes. And finally, the RNA sequencing workflow. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You, you, you purify all of your RNA by something like a solid phase silica extraction technique. It, you, you, can, you, know, you can use a kit to extract all of your mRNA. Um, you can subset your mRNA from total RNA by oligo-DT conjugated beads. So remember, you can use these beads with oligo-DT uh, conjugated to it, which will pull down the poly A tails of the mRNA so um, if you wanted only mRNA, that's how you'd do it. And non-polyadenylated uh, RNA, such as microRNA, if you want to keep uh, microRNAs, you can instead opt to selectively remove rRNA or ribosomal RNA that makes up like 80% of the RNA in the cell. You can actually selectively 
selectively remove this by gel separation and just removing those R RNA bands. And then you could take the rest of what's left, which will include your microRNA, your uh, long non-coding RNA, your mRNA, if you wanted all of the RNA, except for the rRNA. The rRNA is not very fascinating usually. So anyways, once you have all your RNA, you fragment it into manageable segments, around 200 base pairs. And this is so you can faithfully replicate it by PCR, because that's how it's sequenced, is by a special PCR reaction. If it was any longer, your the quality of your reads would, would decrease. Uh, you reverse transcribe all of your RNA into, into cDNA. Uh, you do this by um, using primers directed by the directed to the poly A tail, and then a, a randomly gen, uh, randomly targeted forward primer, and then you just amplify everything. Uh, then you, your second strand synthesis is, is to produce, needed to produce uh, double-stranded cDNA, and this requires a DNA polymerase and some primers. And then finally, in order for your, your now cDNA to actually be sequenced, you have to add some adapters that are chemically ligated to each end of the cDNA molecules. And, and this is needed for the, the sequencer to pull down the cDNA. It needs to be immobilized and then sequenced. Um, so it needs to have these, these special chemically ligated adapters to each end, or else it won't get recognized by the sequencer. And then you, you ship off your cDNA to get sequenced by an outside lab. They return uh, a ton of data as reads. Then, you're, then you do the bioinformatical analysis, which involves um, removing any reads from adapters. You don't care about the adapters. You trim the reads by quality because you, you don't want reads that are not very high quality. You only want the reads you're completely sure about. You want to get rid of all the background. Uh, you normalize the reads by background, non-specific coverage. So you, you should get like a baseline uh, static and you can kind of normalize that out. You don't want that. And then you finally, you can map your reads to, the, to a reference genome. And then you can look for differential uh, gene expression. Well, um, thank you everyone for watching. Um, I hope you were able to get through all of it. I think if you did, you will have learned um, lots of new things. Um, please post any questions you have. If you have any comments, um, please post them below. I check YouTube regularly, so I'll see it and I'll be happy to comment and clarify anything. And uh, thanks for watching.